Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call the August 24th, 2018 board meeting of Santa Cruz Metro to order. Uh, please, uh, we'll, first of all, before we call the, uh, the roll, I'd like to swear in our new ex officio board member, Zach McDaniel. It's great to have you here, and would you uh, carry out that? Situation. Who would be swearing him in exactly? Would that the, council. Be? the council. Yeah, we don't have a judge. Oh, there he is. Here comes a judge, kind of. Yeah. So, so Zach, if you'd stand up and yeah. uh, be sworn in Where as an like ex officio it? member. I think where we can best see with the camera. Okay. okay. Right. Yeah. Right, right where he is. Right. Right. Perfect. Okay, Zach. By the time we're done, you're going to be using a firearm. So <laughs> <laughs> bear with me. Okay. Um, okay. I, Zach McDaniel. I, Zach McDaniel. Do solemnly, do, do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. The duties upon which I'm about to enter. Very good. Thank you. Very good. It's great to have, have you here and be part of our our board uh, as an ex officio member. I think I'll skip now to number four, the roll call, before we get into the first item of business. Um, call, please call the roll. Director Baltimore? Here. Director Chase? Here. Director Coughlin Gomez? Director Dutra? Director Hagen? Here. Director Leopold? Here. Director Lynn? Director Matthews? Here. Direct ex officio Director McDaniel? Here. Director McPherson? Here. Director Ralphwell? Here. Ex officio Director Thomas? Present. We have one. Thank you. I'm also here. I'm Ms. Rutkin. Oh, I'm so sorry. Director Rutkin? Here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we do have a, we have a packed agenda, and we, uh, we're going to want to try to get through it. I think I'll make the announcement, too, that Spanish language interpretation is available on oral communication during oral communications and for any other agenda item for which these services are needed. Um, and today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. And now that we have sworn in Zach, we'd like to introduce his big boss, um, the president and superintendent of Cabrillo College. Is he here yet? Not here yet, but if he comes in, we'll let you know. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, as soon as he gets here, you might have the interpreter yeah. that same announcement you made in Spanish. Oh, excuse me, with the interpreter. Uh, please uh, make the announcement in Spanish that uh, about oral communications. Pleasure, un placer, directors. Buenos días, Carlos Montaverde. Para las personas que prefieren español, voy a estar en la parte de atrás. Thank you. Gracias. Okay, we will go to item number six, uh, Board of Directors comments. Any comments by the board? Um, can I just make yes. another announcement? So anybody coming up to the podium, you might have to push the red button on the mic. And all I'll of the directors, these are new speakers, so hopefully we'll be good to go. Thank you. One, two. There, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, oral written communications to the board of directors. Okay. Okay. There's a uh, yeah, public comment. Any items? Uh, that members of the public would like to address us on that are not on the agenda. That are not on the agenda. Norm wants to comment on the consent agenda. Oh, so he does. Okay. Let, let us know. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. We will. Written communications from Mac, item number eight. You have one on your um, agenda. Any other 
labor organization communications. Any communications from labor? Okay. Um, additional documentation. We do have something, I think. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have item 12.11.2, a minor adjustment to one of our board reports that's on the consent calendar. And just to, to tag on to what Nina was talking about earlier, um, we're testing new microphones. We're hoping we finally found one that works right. Uh, uh, we did point out that when you go to turn it on, there might be a couple of seconds of, of lapse or delay before it starts. So you might put it on a little bit earlier than you want to speak. And when you turn it on, the, the red light will come on so that the chair knows that you want to speak. And let's see, Isaac, anything else you want me to add on the new that's microphones? It. That's that's it. It. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, before, um, you know, on item number 11, that's gonna be a lengthy uh, presentation, so I would like to delay that to see if the president of Carrillo comes here first, and then I think you'd like to make some brief comments, and uh, then we'll go from there. So I think to make this work right and uh, not break it up, we'll, we'll try to we'll just move on with the agenda. We have uh, several items on the consent agenda. Uh, is there anyone that would like to uh, comment or pull an item on the board of, on the consent agenda? Anyone from the public that would like to comment or pull an item from the consent agenda? We would like to comment on the cancellation of the Route 34. That's coming up later. Okay. Yes. Honorable Chair, board members, Mr. Clifford, my name is Norm Reynolds. I'm regional sales manager for the Elite. Sumptuous, but uh, should you approve the purchase of the Gillick buses, I just want to say on behalf of the 900 employees of Gillick, thank you for supporting American jobs, thank you for supporting California jobs, and thank you for supporting local jobs. Um, we look forward to building some great buses for Metro and beginning a long term partnership. So, again, thank you very much for your business and thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Buses. Very good buses. We appreciate the quality. Thank you very much. Um, okay, then we'll be bringing back to the board for uh, move approval of the consent agenda. Second. Move and seconded. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Approved unanimously. We go to item number 13, the presentation of employee longevity awards. I think, I think one person's here at least. Uh, Ernest Brown. Brown is not here. Okay, uh, let me. Um, the only person who possibly here is Matt's here. Matt's oh. here. Okay. Oh. Okay. okay. Um, let me see if. Um, Ulatero Garcia Samano. Uh, Dan Stevenson. Okay. Uh, we will make sure that they're presented. We thank them for their years of service. Um, and we, I think we'll, yes, sorry, Mr. Mr. Chair, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I just want to point out that uh, uh, what I understand is Dan would really like to be here. Okay. And uh, because of his schedule, he couldn't. He's, I think we're going to try to reschedule this next month for, for Dan. Fine, great. We'd like to see him here. That would be great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's no action really needed um, by the, uh, the board. Uh, for, how about uh, the... We have a couple of retirements. I think I'd like to just to get to those quickly. Um, presentation of an uh, employee retirement resolution for Patty David Davidoski. Davidoski. She's not here. Luis Keller. Christopher Lanigan. Just call him Juca. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's, Juca is Juca. Uh, Nobody here. Well, we thank them for their services as well. Um, now we will. Uh, Abel, 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 Abel. Oh, oh, excuse me. Abel Warnock. Yes. Abel's not here either. Abel's here. In spirit. She's here in spirit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would leave the rest of the I guess they wanted to leave early. But just, <laughs> Chair, I would, I would move the resolutions that are on the agenda. Second. Second. They moved and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay, now we will go to the uh, uh, presentation by uh, 
the president of the of Carrillo College, Matthew uh, Wettstein. Great to have you, sir, here, and uh, welcome to Metro. And thank you for uh, Carrillo in the past and present for offering the services that we do provide for so many students there. It's uh, very much needed here for Metro, and I think it's a great service for the students. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to uh, members of the board as well for allowing me to be here just briefly to introduce myself. I've been making the rounds to a lot of different community uh, meetings, and uh, my apologies for being so late and getting around to this one. Uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity <coughs> for Zach to serve as an ex officio member, and very appreciative of that. Um, Cabrillo students have been wonderful in supporting Santa Cruz Metro, and we're proud of the fact that they voted to um, offer transportation fees to help uh, support operations of uh, this organization. And we are very grateful for the service that you provide to our students. If there's anything that I can do to help uh, Santa Cruz Metro in any way through Zach, um, through myself, please don't hesitate to call the college and let us know. I've had great meetings with uh, staff and very appreciative of the welcome that I've gotten around town. And, uh, I see familiar faces around the table uh, and around the, the room as well. So thank you so much for the work that you do. And again, anything that I can do to help you, please let me know. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you for making the effort to be here. You bet. Now we will go back to uh, item number 11. Um, our presentation, uh, Mr. Uh, Beryl Emerson will uh, introduce uh, Jarrett Walker. Good morning, Chair, Board members, staff, and the public. Beryl Emerson, Planning Director. It's my pleasure to introduce Jarrett Walker, an international consultant in public transit network design and policy, with 25 years of experience planning public transit in North America, Europe, Russia, Australia, and New Zealand. This firm, Jarrett Walker & Associations, based in Portland, Oregon, provides transit planning and executive advice to clients worldwide. Jarrett is also the author of uh, Human Transit, How Clearer Thinking About Public Transit Can Enrich Our Communities and Our Lives. At the invitation of Director Leopold, and by the way, happy birthday yesterday, <laughs> Jared has reviewed the current Metro bus service. And remember, this is following two years on from our horrible service reduction. And he will give a short presentation on how to organize our thoughts about our various goals we have for public transit and how to ensure that our policies reflect those goals. Jared first became familiar with Santa Cruz County through his presentation earlier this year as part of the RTC speaker series. Metro staff is particularly looking forward to his thought-provoking discussion, and we see this presentation as timely for two particular reasons. Number one, the upcoming board's strategic business plan retreat later this fall. And number two, the looming November Proposition 6 ballot measure, which could have a major impact on Metro services in the future. Also, I would ask that after today's presentation, the board members read again consent item 12-10, the planning department's annual status report on the state of service planning at Metro and the activities the department plans on taking on in the next couple of years. So without any further rambling on my part, please welcome Jared Walker. Thank you very much. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, um, Beryl, and thanks everyone for your time this morning. I appreciate the chance to chat with you a little bit this morning about some of the big picture issues that you're going to face in any kind of transit planning and any kind of transit policy making, and encourage you to, and you know, maybe give you some new frames of reference for uh, many of the decisions that are going to come up for you and many of the debates that you're already having. Um, I want to start with the question of what fixed transit is. You're by and large a fixed route transit agency. And I want to make sure you understand why that's a good thing. Because there are, there are lots of people out there, particularly from the other side of the hill, who are running around saying that because fixed routes are fixed, they're somehow rigid, and that rigid routes are the product of rigid minds. And that you know there's something new and exciting coming about that will sweep all these dinosaurs away. And that's nonsense, and I want to make sure we all know why. Um, as a city grows denser, um, the overwhelming problem of the city is the problem of sharing space. 
the shortage of space per person is what a city is. A city is lots of people in very little space, which means a city is a place without much space per person, which means that life in a city is about sharing space. Now you have your own decisions to make in these communities about how urban you want to be. Obviously there's a great deal of growth pressure. Obviously there are opportunities for you to grow denser when and where you like, and as you grow denser if you choose to do so, you are also going to become more city-like, and, and the fundamental geometry that plays out here is going to become more and more unavoidable for you. So this, which in my mind is the single most important image that I could show anyone about um, urban transportation, is showing how much space 100 people take if they are all on a bus, all on bicycles, or all in cars. And everything you need to know about the essential role of public transit in densifying cities is in this idea. It's fundamentally about the ability to use space efficiently so that more people fit in the city. Um, it's important to understand right away that I'm talking here about a geometric fact. And because we're talking, we're talking about a geometric fact about big things not fitting in containers that are smaller than themselves. So this is a fact that's not going to change in response to anyone's culture or anyone's uh, values or anyone's ideology. This is just one of those basic substrate facts about the universe. And as a result, it's also not going to be changed by technology. So we know what how much space 100 people take if they're in a bus. We know how much space they take if they're in cars. Here's how much space they take if they're using taxis or Uber or Lyft. Here's how much space they take if they're in driverless cars. <laughs> And someday, perhaps, we may have a driverless bus, which will bring us back to that situation. The ratio of people to vehicles, the vehicle occupancy, is the thing that determines the efficient use of space. The technology has nothing to do with it. Now, the driverless car people will say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, but when we have driverless cars, they'll run a little closer together, and that way they'll save a little more space. Yes, they might. Of course, that only happens at 100% uptake of driverless cars. So it only happens at the end of a very long period of transition. But what's more, driverless cars are going to trigger a horrific outcome called induced demand. Mm -hmm. Induced demand is a biological fact. It's also something you can take to the bank because it's a pretty substrate fact about all life, which is that if something is easy, an organism is more likely to do it. And so when, if driving suddenly becomes massively easier because we remove the hassle of driving so that you can relax with your, with your laptop and drink a martini on your way to wherever you're going, we're going to go more places in cars. So we're going to drive more. And that's going to completely reverse any, any little bit of spatial savings you might have from cars running closer together, even if that turned out to be viable. So one of the things that driverless cars mean is a real crisis around pricing and around the need to, to put pricing systems in place that discourage everyone from, from taking their driverless cars everywhere they want as much as they would like to because the congestion impacts of that are just horrific. So fixed transit is existential for cities. Um, you, the city is impossible without it if you want to get above a certain density. I would argue that the UC campus is already there the San, uh, much of central Santa Cruz is very close to there, and of course a lot depends now on the development decisions you want to make if you want the city to grow denser. You're going to raise this issue more and more. So be, be careful when anyone tells you that new ideas and technologies are disrupting <coughs> fixed route transit. They may have some relevance around the edges in really low density, low demand areas, but we'll come back to that. Even that is more challenging than it sounds. <coughs> so what are we trying to do with transit? And what are we doing when we're doing transportation planning? A lot of you are used to sitting through processes that are fundamentally about the prediction of outcomes. What will this do for the economy? What will this do for the environment? What will this do for traffic? Much of it boiling down to what will ridership be? And I want to suggest that there's another frame that we can use that's equally compelling to talk about and that's able to excite people just as much, but that doesn't actually uh, require that we, uh, but, but that doesn't require that we make such difficult predictions. And that's the basic idea of freedom. It turns out 
that the way to expand ridership is to expand freedom. And by freedom, I mean where you can get to in a given amount of time. So we're working right now on a redesign of the bus network in Dublin, Ireland. And one of the basic tools we're using is, to, is a tool where you can plunk down your pointer everywhere, anywhere you want. <clears throat> this woman is hypothetically at the university. And she's asking, where can I go in 45 minutes? And the answer to that question, that, it, that isn't even a question about transportation. That's a question about freedom. That's a question about what jobs could she hold? What, where, should, where could she go to study? If she, if she works at the university, where could she live? But also, where can you shop? What, you know, who are you going to, who do you have the potential to meet in daily life? All of those things that require that you be able to get there. We can answer that question because there's an existing network and there's an answer to that question in the existing network. There's an answer to that question in a proposed network and there's a difference. And so we're saying under our proposed redesign, she can get to 43% more jobs, 68% more residents can get to there. And that is a quantifiable increase in freedom more people able to go to more places so that they can do more things, so that they have more opportunities in their lives. And the presence of meaningful opportunities and choices before us in life is freedom, right? Freedom is the sense that you have lots of things you can choose in life. It means, for example, that you can probably choose between two grocery stores instead of being stuck going to the only one you can get to, all right? That sort of basic freedom that a customer enjoys. So this is pretty important. And it, because, and it takes us out of transportation. It takes us out of the geekery of transportation and toward talking about fundamentally how do we give people better lives with public transport so that they use, so that it makes sense for them to use public transport. Transportation is physical freedom. So uh, in my view, what we call transportation planning should be called freedom planning. It would be much clearer to everyone about what is at stake if we understood that, we're that when we make decisions about transportation, we're talking fundamentally about how free people should be. Where should they be able to go, which is to say what should be, they be able to do, which is to say how free are they. Um, now, in this culture, many people associate freedom with a vehicle, and, have an, and, and, and so we hear the notion of do cars offer freedom? Well, it depends on where you are. There are places where it does, in a rural environment, cars are, of course, the tool of freedom. In an urban environment, they tend to create their own kind of tyranny. The tyranny of traffic congestion, the unreliability, the, uh, all of those other impacts. Um, and one of the key things to remember is that a meaningful concept of freedom, a concept of freedom that is consistent with civilization, requires that we be able to be free without getting in the way of other people's freedom. And traffic congestion is the failure of that principle. Traffic congestion is when we can only do what we want to do by getting in other people's way. Right? That's the core idea of what traffic congestion is. It's us, get, it's us getting in each other's way, obstructing each other's freedom in the pursuit of our freedom, and being trapped in an infrastructure that essentially forces us to do that through the inadequacy of other alternatives. Now here's the cool thing. Freedom doesn't require a complicated model to predict because freedom is a geometric fact about a network and the land use pattern that it serves. So from a network and from the design of a network and knowledge about the demographics and land use behind it, I can calculate access, how many places, how many jobs somebody can get to in a given amount of time. That's a purely mathematical calculation. There's no prediction of human behavior there. And then next step in a ridership model is to go is to apply a whole bunch of social social science variables to get to a ridership prediction. Now we're way more sure, with all respect to social scientists in the room, we're way more sure about geometry than we are about social science. <laughs> right? It's a vastly higher level of certainty. Um, one of the basic challenges about predictions of human behavior, especially as you go out very far, is that we have to predict future people's behavior based on how people behave now. So if you make a 20-year prediction, for example, as, as is often required for big corridor studies, you know, what's, how are people going to behave in 20 years? The only basis we have for predicting that is how people behave now. Right? So when you think 20 years out, more or less a generation, what we're basically saying to make that prediction, we're telling young people that when you're the same age that your parents are now, you'll behave exactly the way they do. Okay? That's what we have to assume. 
we are assuming that we know your future behavior based on how your parents behave now. That may or may not be a good assumption. We won't really know until we get there. But it's not the sort of assumption, but when you think about it that way, it's maybe not the, the sort of assumption that we want to treat as the absolute bedrock of certainty, when we can talk about freedom instead. So just to point out, when we talk about prediction, we're not talking about freedom. So think about that when you see predictions, um, predictions about markets, predictions about human behavior, predictions about what customers will do, being presented to you as though they are rock solid facts. Because although people do their best to make the best predictions they can, if I, I feel much more confident in predicting the permanence of geometric times. I am quite sure of what that that large objects don't fit in small ones. I'm quite sure that will it, large objects don't fit in small containers. I'm quite sure that will still be true in 2100. I'm quite sure that that's true on Mars. We can be very sure about that. And so be aware of the kind of certainty we're talking about. You know. The principle of induced demand, just a basic fact of biology, an organism will tend to do something that's easier and will tend to do it more if it's easier. Again, it's true in 2100, and if there's life on Mars, it's true of that too. So if you have to predict, predict the permanence of math, physics, and basic biology, and be suspicious, it may be necessary, but at least bring some caution when you see predictions of human behavior beyond the most universal biological motivations. So, when we're trying to maximize freedom with public transit, what are we doing? What we're doing, if I want to maximize freedom for the most people, is to lay out high-frequency lines, forming a connected network that's reasonably fast and reliable, and that's focused on transit-friendly places. And that will turn out to be politically the hardest part of this. Let me just step through that quickly. Frequency, long ago I coined the term frequency as freedom. Really, frequency is part of freedom, but it's a necessary condition. Frequency, how often the bus comes, is a cubed value. It's powerful because it does three independent things. And because those things are independent, we tend to get a nonlinear payoff from it. Frequency is reduced waiting. Frequency is also easier connections. You get off one bus, the other, the next bus is coming soon. It's easy to make the connection. And it's the connections that allow people to move out across a network to wherever they're going instead of just being able to go downtown. And finally, reduced impact of disruptions. Bus breaks down, another will be along soon. That's why lines with higher frequency tend to not just have higher ridership, but higher ridership over cost, higher ridership per quantity of service. That's very striking. Uh, every time my firm does a transit plan for some agency, we take all of their route level data, <coughs> dump it into a database, and just keep growing it. This is higher frequency to the left on the x-axis, higher productivity on the y. And you see that higher frequency gives us higher productivity, and that you see a bit of an upward curve to that. That's striking because frequency actually pulls the productivity ratio down. In, in the bottom of the productivity ratio is quantity of service. And if you increase frequency, you've increased that. You've initially pulled productivity down. And yet, the overall relationship of higher frequency tends to be to higher productivity. Now, part of that is we tend to deploy higher frequency in the places where the land use pattern and everything else is favorable. But still, that relationship is so strong and it's so counterintuitive that it's worth pausing over. Concentrating service on fewer streets so that you can run more frequent service really is the key to success in ridership terms. And, um, and, it's, and, it, and, it, and that's extremely counterintuitive. Also, I'll mention very few people will come before you and ask you to do that. Many more people will come before you and ask you to keep a particular bus route or to add a bus route up into a particular place. Very few people will come to you and talk about frequency, and yet it actually is foundational to our success. Because, of the, because frequency tends to be invisible, because we can't draw a picture of it, a lot of policy work now is going into creating frequent network brands. Vancouver in Canada, one of the leaders on this, um, uh, 10 years ago, they adopted a policy that said that over half of all population and jobs will be on the frequent network. Frequent network to them means all the services that run every 15 minutes or better all day. And um, they actually achieved that policy they achieved that goal within a few years, not, by the way, just by expanding the frequent network to more places, but also by development occurring along the frequent network as it already was, so that a greater share of the population ended up living on the network that was already there. Those are always the two steps. A long-term frequent network vision can help you organize land use thinking, can help you, for example, build apartments with less parking in certain places, where as a matter of policy, we know transit will be good, 
because people in those apartments can be expected to use transit more. Apartments with less parking means more affordable apartments, and that's a key step on affordability. So that's the key thing here. Frequency is tied very much to concerns about affordability because especially frequent bus service is useful enough to be liberating. Unlike rail service, though, it's, it's abundant enough. It can go enough places that it can't possibly drive up housing prices everywhere the way a rail station often does. And the key thing is that it helps you build apartments with less parking, uh, which is a key to affordability. And certainly at the density of some of your cities, you need to be talking about that, particularly given the affordability concerns here. Here's where you are with frequency. During the school year, you've got roughly 15-minute frequency. That's the red line between downtown Santa Cruz and the university. Other than that, you are primarily a network of 30-minute long-distance lines and hourly short-distance lines. So you see, for example, um, here's your, I guess I don't have a pointer here. You can see the 30-minute lines going north to San Lorenzo Valley, the, the, the complex braid of 30-minute lines between Santa Cruz and Watsonville. By the way, the Santa Cruz Watsonville adds up to four buses an hour. There are actually four buses an hour there. It's just each one does a slightly different thing along the way. It could add up to a total 15-minute headway point to point if you wanted it to. But you can also see a lot of areas with 60-minute headways. That's the intentionally pale. Um, is anyone seeing that? No, it doesn't work over there. Yeah, we can see it. It's pale. Right here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can see that. You just can't see my pointer. Um, so, you know, interesting areas in Southern Capitola, Live Oak, a lot of the eastern part of Santa Cruz, south of SoCal Avenue, actually has 60-minute service, those pale blue lines that you can barely see. Over such short distances, <laughs> over such short distances as you're serving there, that service borders on useless. Because when we're going a very short distance, when you're going a very short distance, you need a higher frequency. Because we experience our wait time as a percentage of the total travel time, right? That's, your, that's why you'll wait an hour for a flight to LA, but you'll wait a day for a flight to London, right? We experience that the waiting time relative to the size of the total trip. Eastern Santa Cruz, Capitola, the trip distances are so short that, you know, that you know, no one with any options is going to wait an hour to go such a short distance. Whereas it is not unreasonable to ask people to wait half an hour to go to the San Lorenzo Valley, or potentially to go to Watson. Those distances are long enough, but that can make sense. So let's talk about the harder part, which is where does high ridership go? Because when I talk about freedom, we want to say freedom for everyone. But the irony, the, the, cruel the cruel fact for elected officials here, is that the way we get freedom to the most people is not to try to use transit to get freedom to everyone. Because some people live in places where getting good service to them is just fantastically expensive. And let's talk about why. So density, we hear a lot about density, and it's because, and again, I want you to notice, I'm describing geometry here. In this, in this series of explanations, I'm not going to talk anything about human behavior. I'm going to talk about the geometric relationship between land use patterns and bus routes. So density. Um, those two bus routes have the same cost to operate. They each have two buses on them. The one in the top image has twice as many people around every stop. So of course, twice as many people, twice the size of the market, of course you have higher ridership. More, to put it more geometrically, we are delivering freedom to twice as many people by running down the street in the first neighborhood than in the second neighborhood. So low density is a negative for ridership. More importantly, it means that we are providing freedom to far fewer people by focusing our resource there. Walkability. On a fixed route, you have to walk out to the stop. That is the source of the incredible productivity of, of fixed routes relative to anything you can do running around with little vehicles going to people's stores. So um, it matters whether you can walk out to the stop. And so in more historic street grids where, you, where it's easy to walk out to the stop because you have a connected local street network, you're going to get freedom to more people on thus higher ridership. So these two images on the left, that's a bus stop in the center. And the circle is a quarter mile radius around the bus stop, which is often something we draw at a high level of abstraction. You know, what's the catch in there in the bus stop? But what really matters is the street network in that area and whether you can actually walk to the bus stop in a quarter mile. So, so each of these we've shaded in black, the part of the street network where people that are actually a quarter mile walk from the bus stop. And what you'll see, of course, is that if you have an old street grid like you have in Central Santa Cruz, 
it's easy for most of the area in the circle to actually walk to the stop in that distance. If you have a shredded, disconnected street grid, it becomes very hard and you end up, the bus stop is literally just serving fewer people because of the barriers presented by the street network. And obviously there are other barriers too, like freeways and rail lines and so on. But in any case, um, this is a, so that lower street network is a negative in terms of the basic question of how much freedom are we providing to how many people by running good service in this place. The other issue, of course, is that it's, it makes no sense to stop anywhere on a street where it is not safe to cross the street because transit will always take you from this side of the street and return you to that side of the street. If you can't cross the street at that point, you have one-way service. We have not really provided useful freedom. Now, my architect and urban design friends all know about density and walkability, but linearity is a problem that's peculiar to transit. And that is that what we need to do with a fixed route is string together a bunch, is serve a bunch of places such that a single line is useful for going to many different places along the line, for connecting many different places. So here are two hypothetical cities that are made of the same four places, but the one on the top, the places are all in a straight line. The one on the bottom, the places are all back from a straight line, so that in each case you have to deviate up into them to get to them. So, you know, the university on the hilltop, the, um, the employment center in a business park by the freeway, the large residential cul-de-sac that you have to drive into and get back out of in the same way, something like Rio del Mar, for example, um, or, of course, the Walmart behind a quarter mile of parking. Each of these gives us a, a worse outcome in terms of our ability to provide freedom efficiently because we have to deviate to them and that makes the line less straight and that makes the line less useful for riding the through. So I thought I would show you an incredible local example. It's actually the bus route that comes up here once an hour. Look at this. Even once you've spent some time figuring out what this bus actually does, it takes a while to trace through all this and figure that out. Um, this, is, this line is basically nothing but deviations, right? It is wandering around exclusively focused on getting to places that are nonlinear. They are hard to get to. You have the county facilities up in the northeast, which include some critical social service facilities, which should never be placed in cul de sacs like that, where they're hard to get to, up on Emily Avenue. You have the, the, the Harvey West, the industrial area over to our west. You have this location here at Vernon Street. Each of these requires going there, turning around, and coming back while other people ride through trying to get to other places. This is pretty much the definition of a route that nobody with any choices would ever use. Right? And so you have to have incredibly low expectations for it. You have to understand also, you must understand pretty clearly, this is not Santa Cruz Metro's fault that the community got built this way, such as to create this, this, this terrible situation for fixed route transit. These are just not places that you're going to be able to go with any, uh, uh, and actually provide useful service that would be liberating to everyone because the geography is just completely hostile to what you're doing. So you have to make decisions about these places. Okay, is this the best we can do? Should we, um, should we have some sort of little van thing going on? Well, we'll talk about that. Those are much less productive than they appear. Or should, we, or should we just say, ride your bike to these places on some level? I mean, should, or, 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 or maybe there's you know, a senior disabled kind of service, but you know, we expect most other people will find other means. Because transit just can do so little when you have this kind of extremely nonlinear development pattern where you have to drive into cul-de-sacs and back out over and over again. Notice the way this also messes up your ability to actually provide a clean two-way service in a place where it might be useful like going up and down River Street or going up and down Ocean Street. Ocean Street's a perfectly good two-way kind of street that would support frequent transit service. But because you're doing all these loops, you can't really deliver that simple thing that people could actually find useful. The fourth is proximity. Obviously, it costs more to go longer distances than shorter ones. If, hypothetically, Davenport could be moved to a little bit east of Wilder Ranch, it would support more transit service. Right? <laughs> but because it is far away, it supports less transit service because it costs more to get there. Brutally obvious point, but when you hear, particularly as we start talking about rural services, if you hear, well, those people have it, why don't we? The answer is often, you are just very far away. And that makes it more, more expensive to serve. So that, those kinds of freedom-maximizing choices that you would make 
involved the painful decision that transit is not the best way to provide freedom to a lot of places. Transit is the best, the, the way transit maximizes freedom overall is to focus on the places where the geography is favorable. And I can't emphasize too strongly, people will take this personally. They'll say you don't like them. They'll say you're, you're, you're discriminating against them. No, it's not, your transit service is not about who you are, but it is about where you are. And it can't help but being about where you are because the geography determines what's going to be viable if, if freedom and ridership are the norm. So it obviously raises the question, is ridership even what you want? And this, and this brings us to the issue of the ridership coverage trade -off. And this is another issue that's a bit like plumbing. You're used to thinking about your own ways of, you know, of lots of different frames that people want to bring to talking about public transit, lots of different ways they want to talk about it. But then there's a way that the technician who's responsible for making it happen will insist that you talk about it. And this is that sort of conversation. So I want you to imagine that situation where you're, where you're, you know, you're, you're remodeling a part of your house and you've got a plumber there. And the plumber is looking under your sink. And he says, look, I could just um, wrap this up with uh, duct tape and we could do it like this and it cost a couple hundred dollars and it'd last a few years. Or I could put in a whole new assembly just like new with chrome and everything and it would last for decades and that would cost a lot more. And so he's asking you, to choose between two of your goals, right? Cheap or durable? Do you want it cheap? Do you want it durable? And the thing to notice about that story is that you have to answer the question in the way that the technician framed it. He's there to implement your values, but to do that, he gets to ask you questions about your values, and you have to ask the question, answer the question that, that he asked. And that's, and, and you, you can imagine other ways of dealing with this. You know, a plumber asks you this question, you don't want to think about it, so you like pick up a magazine and start talking about the look and feel you want of the place, and you know how you know that, that all. You start talking about that, and the plumber just stands there with his wrench and waits until you answer his question, because that's all he can do. You, until you answer his question, he can't implement your values. So this is that sort of situation. It's what I call a plumber's question. So here's a fictional urban area. The dots represent residents and jobs, so dots close together represent density. We have 18 buses to serve this hypothetical thing. If the goal were ridership, we would do this. If the goal were ridership, which also means maximum freedom for most people, for the most people, we would do this. We would put all our service on just the two big, biggest streets we would serve about 70% of the population by doing that. And for that 70% of the population, we'd maximize where they could get to. And that would be the best possible outcome, on average, for the city overall. It would be to provide excellent service to that 70%. And that would be the highest ridership way to deploy this service. However, Mrs. Jones lives in the southeast corner of the city, and she doesn't like this already. OK. I actually had this experience many times. The first 10 years of my career was designing transit systems of about your size and smaller all over California. And I would come in at the beginning of the project, and I would say, OK, what's your goal for this project? And they would say, right, 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 right. So I would design them this. And they would say, but what about Mrs. Jones? And I would say, you told me you wanted ridership. You didn't tell me about Mrs. Jones. So now, if you have a goal that's about everybody having a little bit of service, that's something else. That's this. So another way that I could spend, so I could spend 18 buses this way and have the maximum ridership system, or I could spend them this way. And now I have 10 routes instead of two, which means that whereas here the buses come every 10 minutes, here they come every hour, because I've spread them over so many routes. And because the buses come every hour, most people don't find them very useful, and as a result, most people don't ride them, and as a result, ridership is really low. But we covered Mrs. Jones wherever she is. We provided a little bit of service everywhere. So I want you to notice the ways in which the expectation of coverage, which tends to show up at you at this podium as people saying, we pay taxes too, where's our bus, causes you to spread resources out to the point that service is pretty useless to most people. Although, it is still much appreciated by the small number of people who use it. And that's pretty much the normal feature of coverage service. Coverage service shows up at the bottom of your productivity rankings because it's not really trying to be a high ridership service. But 
when you try to cut it, people come out and defend it. Um, and so you have to make that decision. So what I've tended to do is say, look, let's acknowledge that you have a non-ridership goal. You have a, a goal that's different from your ridership goal, but it's in conflict with it. And so, it's, so the question to ask is, how do you want to balance these goals? It's not that one of these goals is right or wrong. It's just that mathematically, they are opposite in the way that the plumber knows that the goal of cheapness and the goal of durability are opposite. And you're going to have to choose them between them in giving him direction about what to do. Now, these goals line up with a bunch of other things that people want out of transit and a bunch of other things that people tend to say going into the transit conversation. Think like a business. Well, what a business does is maximize the number of customers it can serve. Focus where ridership potential is highest. The ridership goal gives us, gives us the sort of maximum revenue goal, which, which appeals to a certain kind of think like a business perspective. It's also the goal that supports dense and walkable development because that's what it focuses on, because that's the high ridership solution. But it's also the, the, the uh, goal that gives you all of the environmental benef benefits of transit. Transit's benefit for the environment arises from transit uh, being ridden, not just from transit existing. Transit has to be ridden for it to have any green benefits. And so the, the competition with cars, the BMT reduction, the emission benefits, all the things that come out of that require ridership. On the opposite side goal, though, there are excellent reasons to run a coverage goal. You're thinking like a public service there. You know, it often arises from a goal like access for all. When a transit agency says access for all. Um, now, Caltrans, for example, would never say that its mission is access for all. Its mission is to create a backbone highway network. Um, but it's not going to run a state highway to everyone's front door. But access for all in transit has come to be understood as there needs to be a transit line to everyone. And that, of course, gives you a coverage challenge. It causes you to spread service out to the point that, um, that, that you, know, you, end up, you end up with very infrequent service. The coverage goal, of course, tends to be preferred by, by people who represent lower density areas. It has two other really, really strong reasons, though. One is very much bound up in the idea of, of lifeline access for everyone. Somebody comes up to you and says, I don't know what I will do without this bus because it is my lifeline. And some of those people are right. And the question becomes, OK, that's a re that may be a reason for you to run coverage service. Just know that coverage service is what you're doing. And finally, political geography, service to every member city or service to every electoral district. You obviously have that kind of dynamic here. It tends to lead you toward a coverage goal because it causes you to spread service out. So it helps to choose a point on the spectrum. It helps to know where you are and know what you're doing. Right now, your system is about 60% ridership, 40% coverage. What I mean by that is about 60% of your service is where it would be if the goal of your network were right now. About 40% is not. Um, and so seeing it that way, there's now a knob on your dashboard that you as the board could turn. You could turn that knob and say, we want more ridership, less coverage. Or we want more coverage, less ridership. And you could then expect and understand why you'll get certain outcomes as a result. Right? You should expect that if you turn the knob toward coverage by, for example, saying yes to people who want you to run a bus out into a new rural area, you should expect ridership, overall ridership and productivity to go down. If you turn the knob the other way, eliminating some services out there, Eliminating some low ridership services, dealing with people being angry about that and going ahead and doing that, you should expect productivity to go up. But the point is, the, the knob is on your dashboard and you can turn it as a board. And, and that will have those impacts, and it's going to be difficult either way, but it is something that's within your power to do. Just to give you a sense of what I mean, Ridership services, right now, when I talk about the 60% of your service that's high ridership, it's interesting what they are. Um, they're the UCSC services, but they're also the long hauls, Santa Cruz to Watsonville, Santa Cruz to San Lorenzo Valley. Um, San Lorenzo Valley, by the way, does stunningly well for a rural service, and, um, is, and it really goes to the intensity of need up there, but also the, the minimal number of alternatives up there for getting back and forth. Um, coverage services, the other 40%, the Watsonville locals, the most other rural service where you're not going to a big place like Watsonville or Felton, 
and most of the circuitous short standard food services like that crazy Route 4 that I just showed. <laughs> it's interesting to notice, though, almost all of your coverage service has an equity dimension. All, when you're running low margin coverage, coverage service, you're generally going to hard to reach disadvantaged areas, areas of some, of some economic disadvantage. So that's a dimension to what you'll be dealing with. Um, and by the way, when I talk about equity, it's mostly equity in the terms of income, usually not in terms of rates. Um, by and large, I, I think you rarely find you had disparate impact in, in civil rights terms if you shifted, say, resources from ridership to coverage within Watsonville, for example, uh, or, or vice versa. But you cert but there is, it is true that a lot of the cover services you're running are reaching relatively low-income people who are in expensive to serve places for reasons of the geography I described. Let me run through you through the quickest case study of just how we use this tool. It's on a geography you probably know, just over the hill. Uh, I'm just going to talk through it very fast and then I'll be done. We did a network redesign project for BTA a few years ago. Uh, it's still waiting to be implemented. It'll be implemented as soon as the BART extension opens. And we showed them their current all day frequency, same colors you saw in your map red equals high frequency, 15 minutes or better, blue equals 30, green, which you can hardly see, equals 60. And we showed them some alternatives. We said, okay, Here's where you are. You're at about 70% ridership. Do you want to look at 80 or 90? Because they were very concerned about moving toward ridership. They didn't want to talk about moving toward coverage. So we, we introduced these maps, and we said, OK, there's your current frequency. And if, here's what it would do if it would look like if we just cleaned things up but kept it at 70% ridership, 30% coverage. Here's what it looked like if we went to 80%. And here's what it would look like if we went to 90%. And what you'll see is two things as I go through these. You'll see more red lines appearing, high frequency lines where there's high density, and you'll see blue and green lines disappearing, coverage disappearing in order to put more resources in those high ridership areas, 70, 80, 90, right? By the time we get to 90, there are large white areas on this map. And you can imagine the people in those areas who will freak out and who will be angry at you. And that's an intrinsic part of this process for agencies who want to think this way, as BTA chose to do. Now, the interesting thing is that why on earth would anyone do this? You know, the elected officials' response is, oh my god, there's a bus route disappearing from my city, my constituency, my electoral district. Um, absolutely not. Well, actually, down in the Almaden Valley in the south, we had a San Jose City Councilor who said, yes, please cut my bus service. It's a lousy investment for the county as a whole. Um, we'd rather have a little more light rail frequency and we'll drive down to it because and we'll, we'll drive to it or take lift to it or whatever because we can understand we have lots of density up here. This isn't the place we want to fix rail service. So it will surprise you sometimes what position people will take and every, every elected official gets to figure this out for their own way. But just wanted to quickly show you the freedom outcomes we were able to describe because on the surface going from this to that is so painful and I don't, I, I don't want to minimize how painful it is. The public hearings will be horrible if you propose to do something like this, which is why I'm not telling you to do it. I'm going to be very clear. I'm not advising you to do this. I never, I was very clear to the, to the BTA board. I was never going to tell them what they should do. I was never going to make a recommendation about this. Any more than the plumber is going to tell you whether it should be cheap or durable. He asks you the question. You, as the customer, get to answer. But we were able to show them this kind of outcome. So for any hypothetical person, location in the city, this happens to be Mission College. You imagine a person located there. This woman is named Jane. She's a kind of every person. Um, and there's where she can get to in each amount of time. 15 is white, 30 is dark blue, uh, six, 45 is light blue, and pink is 60. That's where she can get to in those amounts of time in concept seven. By the, as we move toward concept 90 and we have all those painful impacts, here's how that changes, 80, 90. So if you're on that high frequency network, and a majority of the population is, about two thirds of the population is, your, the usefulness of the transit network gets better and better for you as resources are shifted into these higher ridership, higher freedom solutions. We can show exactly what that means. You know, the journey from the existing system to the proposed system, like at the bottom, by the time you get to network uh, 90, she can get to twice as many jobs, 100% more jobs in 30 minutes. That's also a proxy for shopping, social, all kinds of other things. We have essentially doubled the level of freedom that she has in her life by virtue of having gone from 90, if you choose to do that. 
The board, by the way, went through this whole conversation and came down at 80, uh, and, and that's what we ended up preparing as the final plan, and again, that plan will be in, in uh, when BART opens. So this is an example of that thought process, leading to a kind of a clear decision, and the important thing is the board understands the consequences of the decision. That's why we took them through this process, so that they would not be surprised then. They would know what the coverage routes are, and they would expect low performance from them. They know what the ridership routes are, and they expect high performance from them to sum up. Um, I want to raise one other issue that's very interesting, which is the surprisingly good performance of your long-haul services to Felton, uh, San Lorenzo Valley, and also um, um, uh, Santa Cruz Watsonville, and also to UCSC. Santa Cruz Metro, Metro's most successful services focus on trips that aren't conducive to walking or cycling. This is a pretty good community for walking and cycling compared to a lot of places in California. Um, and so you tend to be succeeding where there's a big barrier to walking and cycling, either the hill going up to UCSC or just the very long distances to Watsonville or to Felton, and the hill in Felton's case as well. So the other thing to remember is that very short trips need outrageously high frequency if you're actually going to compete. This is what's wrong even with most downtown shuttle services that you see in a lot of places. If you're actually going to compete for a trip that's one or two miles long, you have to be incredibly frequent for, it to be, for that to be preferable to just starting to walk. Or even starting to roll in a wheelchair to, in many cases. Because a long wait for a short trip is something very few people will do. It doesn't make sense to do. So as a result, shorter distance services in a, city, in a region of your skin will usually be coverage services. And this is very interesting because it, it, it's a new way of thinking about the balance between long distance and short distance. The value of your long distance services is that they connect pedestrians from one walkable place to another walkable place over a distance that's too far to walk. And that may be an interesting way of thinking about your work in the future. So to sum up, if you wanted higher ridership, we know what you would do. If you're running coverage services, that's fine, as long as you don't expect ridership from them. Things to consider, adopt a policy about where you want to be on the ridership coverage split. Right now it's about 60 40. And it's helpful also to have some priorities for coverage service. Right now, the priority seems to be you run coverage services where there's a strong economic, you know, where, where you have a significant low income population. The value of having a policy is that you turn the dial consciously instead of turning it accidentally. Turning the dial accidentally is what happens when someone comes and, and, and asks you for, to add a low ridership round, a coverage round, and you do. And then you're surprised because average ridership went down. Well, no, you shouldn't be surprised. You turned the dial away from ridership and toward coverage when you do that. That's actually a completely predictable outcome. So again, do whatever you want as long as you understand what the outcomes will be. So thanks very much. Happy to take your questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. that on out. Uh, thank you for that presentation. I'd like to uh, Get some comments uh, from the board before we uh, go out to the uh, general public. John, uh, uh, thank you, um, Jared. I wonder if you could put that uh, map of uh, Santa Cruz up with the uh, the routes. It was a, you, it was an early slide. Yeah, it was an early slide. I'll take a while to get back to it, but I will. Um, I don't have the right control to do it. Well. Yeah, well, just where it was colored. Uh, right. You know, where there, that is. Is that one? there it is. Yeah, and so I think to, to me this is a very telling um, map uh, uh, because in part uh, this doesn't line up with uh, the, the I will just point out the county's uh, uh, voters development strategy uh, or the county board of supervisors uh, development strategy because the voters uh, set an urban services line back in 1978 and said we're going to concentrate development in the urban services line. If you look at this map, most of those areas where we say we're going to concentrate development are in light blue. Mm -hmm. um, and now we're, we, the county just finished a, a sustainable Santa Cruz County plan, which doubles down on that strategy, which is that we're going to become more dense um, along those transit corridors that are light blue. And um, and then we're gonna we're, we're gonna just up the ante a little bit more when we're gonna say we're gonna give density bonuses uh, anywhere, but because of the uh, uh, the voter approved urban services line, 
it's going to be right in those areas where it's light blue. Right. So uh, this is, uh, I represent a big area here that's in light blue, so I'm very sensitive to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. yeah, listen, I, I, this is many years, this isn't like this Board of Supervisors is the only one, but it's, it's, this, is, this is what we've been doing for years. Uh, this uh, board, not many of these members, but this board, when we looked at the short-term transit plan, I think that's what we called it, short-term, I don't remember. Short -range. Yeah, short-range short -range tra tra transit plan, didn't even consider anything outside the city of Watsonville and the city of Santa Cruz as a transit corridor, which blew my mind and I argued against. Um, and I think this shows the failings of, that, uh, of, of doing that because you only have these, these routes, but you don't have it where the, where the people are. So I think that, that we, we have to sync up what our development strategies are with our transit strategies uh, to be more effective at meeting the transportation needs. Because our goal along, whether it's the city's uh, transit corridors plan or the county's sustainable uh, uh, Santa Cruz plan, is that we're gonna look at modest increases in densities um, along transit corridor, with the idea is that people would actually be able to take a bus instead of have everybody having cars. But when you look at that light blue section, it's pretty easy to see. I mean, I would be, it would be fascinating to look at Jane uh, on uh, Capitola Road and uh, and see where she can get to in terms of jobs if uh, if we could increase the uh, service there. Uh, uh, so, you know, I think this is, our board has to think about this because, as I say, we have to link up our transit strategy with our development strategy. Right now, they, to me, they seem very disconnected. The other thing that I will just say about this, and this is uh, uh, not a knock on the San Lorenzo Valley. I think you made a point that the San Lorenzo Valley, um, those routes get used. but. As someone who represents the Summit area, the Soquel Hills, the, the you know the the Soquel Valley, they're not even light blue. They're 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 white, right? I mean, so those people don't even get. It. So when we when we when we talk about a coverage system, um, where we're trying to reach people, I, I have a there's a there's a large number of Santa Cruz County residents who don't even get infrequent service. And if you think about where people are getting housing now, affordable housing, they're going further out. So it's, you know, either we're going to have a strategy where we build um, uh, more dense, affordable rental units that will probably be in the urban areas, and we better put transit service there. Um, or we should, uh, you know, if we're going to be caring about coverage, let's let's talk about the thousands of people who aren't getting coverage at all right now. And these are, I think, big decisions for us to make as, a, as an agency. Uh, but you can see where a lot of people are being left off. So I appreciate that the, uh, the frame to, to be able to think about it. Um, I've, I've seen your presentation now a couple times because uh, you've been a regular visitor here to Santa Cruz, but it helped me think about the kind of choices that we need to make here in Santa Cruz. So thank you. Director Bachter. I just want to uh, quick on top of that point. You can leave this. This uh, what, what scares me on this is you, you made the, the point about coverage, uh, and I'm just imagining this with the 70, 80, 90 implemented into this, which I know you haven't done yet. I imagine, but if we were to look at this going do the 70, 80, 90 shift, probably all those blue lines in your area would disappear. Is would be my fear. Well, no, I mean, uh, I, I would argue that if, well, I mean, if, you, if, you, did, if, you, if you went up to higher ridership, those would become darker because that's where the people are. I'll, I'll let the speaker, right? okay, if you did, just speculate, because I know you haven't done it formally, but if, if there was a 70, 80, 90 chart, what would this map look like? If I had to speculate on what the network would look like at 90, I think we would look at Live Oak and some of those other areas and we would say, hmm. Density coming in there, but on the other hand, short trip distances such that we have to be in there with high frequency to be useful at all. And if, for example, a cycleway were being developed for that same corridor, 
and we were expecting a higher and higher cycling vote share, that gives me a smaller and smaller transit market. So we'd have to have long conversations about that, because maybe it would depend on you know, the long-term level of reliance on transit that is planned for those neighborhoods. But I could see, a, I could see if I were working from the existing ridership and the existing patterns, that a 90% alternative might very well just be 15-minute service on SoCal Drive from, from Santa Cruz to Watson. And, you know, Maybe, you know, you know and, and, you know, probably you could get some kind, maybe you could probably get a second 15 minute route in there to Capitola through Live Oak if you took out everything else. You know, you'd be taking out the three of the four. And, you know, and then the Watsonville local network, I think, uh, I'll tell you, Watsonville local network really needs a look. You should probably take a closer look at that network generally. It's got a lot of one way loops in it, it's got a lot of stuff that's, um, that looks like it could be improved on. Um, and there's probably, you know, there's probably, so I wouldn't speculate on what a Watsonville local network would look like, but my guess is that, you know, there would certainly still be one. Thank you. Um, Mr. Hagen, uh, Director Hagen. I live in Watsonville. I'm thinking of a couple, three routes. That when you get consistently three or four passengers a day, morning and night, those things are detrimental. We cut out the 77 because that's what happened. And I'm also thinking, you know, there are areas we go to on 79 route, clear out Lakeview, and there again, you're going to have to deal with do we go coverage or consistency or ridership. And I've got proof as well as thoughts. Let me just say this. Let me just say this about Watsonville. I'm sorry, I should have had a photograph, an image of it here. Watsonville has a route that looks just like this. It's the 79. It drives around in circles. You um, you you can ride 20 minutes in circles, 30 minutes to get where you're going, because you're going to so many other places along the way. So again, you have to be really, you have to have really no options at all to use something like that. And it's important to remember, even when you're talking about very low income people, there are very few of them who truly have no options at all. If nothing else, they will walk or ride an old bicycle or do something. Um, and so that's just not a service that's of much use. And when I look at a, at a city of the density of Watsonville and with the kind of level of social needs that exist in Watsonville, um, and look at it as a place where really we should be helping low-income people own fewer cars because that makes them wealthier if they don't have to spend that much money on cars. You know. Think about the, the low-income family whose kid is turning 16 and they have to decide whether to buy a car or save them to go to college. Right? I mean, those are the kinds of choices that families make. And, um, you know, a bus, a bus driving around in circles that, like that for an hour is not going to help him you know, it's not going to help them decide that he doesn't need a car. So, so those are some of the things that I think arise, and I think that Watsonville particular I mean, Santa Cruz, you just have to decide whether to go into those cul-de-sacs or not. Watsonville, you've got, I think, more of an opportunity to build, um, you know, you've got, more, you've got a more connected street system, and you've got more different ways the local network would work, and I would encourage you to take a closer look. Director Rockett. Could you help us? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm probably the only member of the board who's been around long enough to remember when we made the decision to have uh, what we roughly call urban routes and rural routes and we had right. different ridership expectations of those. And that was sort of our way of, it. we didn't have a sophistication of the way you presented this, but I see the pants came to this idea that we should you know, have a certain amount of our service dedicated to high density, more frequent, et cetera, and a certain, certain amount of it would be in more rural areas. <clears throat> That's the kind of tool we've used, I think, up until pretty recently to make decisions about um, <clears throat> whether we should cut or every time you have to do a budget cut, which route should go. And so, you know, the rural routes that weren't meeting their minimal expectations um, tended to get cut, um, and the urban ones that didn't meet theirs as well. And I'm just sort of wondering what, I think the board probably, I, know, I can't speak for the board, but I, my guess is that people grasp your point and 
have the idea that we should probably be increasing our ridership to some extent, not how much is the issue. But I, I guess the question is what kind of a tool is sort of useful for figuring out if you're going to dedicate a certain, let's say this side, we're going to, you know, instead of 40, we're going to have 25% of our service be, let's not call it rural now, but uh, have coverage or something. What kind of a tool do you use since ridership is not the, the you know, a, rather than a sort of a political slugfest where everybody fights for their local constituents, which we've been thankfully not, it's been a good board about trying to think about the whole system generally. What kind of a tool allows you to make that kind of decision about where coverage goes if it's not just who has the most political might and can line up the most allies and that's uh, so you asked a couple of questions about coverage. You <coughs> asked first of all, are we talking about significant populations of people who are really severely disadvantaged by not having the service? And there you're usually looking at income. You may to some extent be looking at distribution of senior populations if you have a concentration of senior populations or something like that. Um, then you look at, and, and, and then you also look at sort of how much duplication does this service require? How useful is this really? Um, so I'm going to make an example of, um, there's a very awkward route you have out last. I'll actually walk up and trace it for you. Route 3 comes out of downtown. When it physically can, it does this whole duplication, this whole deviation down to the boardwalk area and back. Comes around here on top of another route, and then it serves that little piece of mission that nobody else is serving, which happens to be a commercial stretch. And then it comes over here and wanders through this and ends up at Natural Bridges. So every little nook and cranny that that route is hitting, where it is unique, it is, it is the only coverage. But it's a ridiculously circuitous thing that it has to do in order to, come, in order to hit those little pieces. That is probably a route that would drop off very quickly. That'd be one of the first routes that would disappear if you turned the dial to a ridership. It's not just that, uh, and, and it's not just a judgment about how important that, or unimportant that coverage is, it's also just the fact that the, the, the linearity is so poor, the overlap of other services that you have to do is so great, that you're getting very little coverage at a very high cost. And that's a, that's a very poor performer, and it's understandable. And you know, I could point to the 79 in Watsonville, which, which has a similar camp geography to it. So, um, so, you, so things like that would drop away. And everything you see in Live Oak, um, everything you see south of Soquel Drive and east of downtown would probably collapse back <coughs> with one round. We would figure out whatever the one round is that seems to have the best stuff on it and, and make one route there as frequently as you could. Um, and the rural services would go away. Again, I, I, I encourage you not to have a category of rural services because many people think of Felton San Lorenzo as a rural market, but it's actually a very strong interurban market. Um, Felton and San Lorenzo are, are, are sufficiently high generators, especially since the threat also goes to Scotts Valley, um, that you have, you know, you've hooked up quite a strong set of generators there, and that route does very well. So, um, uh, that's why the urban rural is not so useful as ridership coverage. This helps everyone come back to the fact that we're just talking about density. And yeah, rural by definition is low density. It's, it's, a, it's a sparser market. But linking significant communities across rural, across gaps, especially gaps that are too far to walk or cycle or that are uphill or whatever, that's a powerful market. Because you're a city that's largely, you know, your region is largely otherwise pretty friendly to walking and cycling, a lot of people are doing that. And of course, you have policies that you want a lot more people to be doing that particularly in the flatter areas and over distances of one or two miles. If I could add, we, we used to have four th number threes, literally A, B, C, and D. Um, right. And we got, in one of those budget cut years, whatever it happened, we got rid of all of one of them, left of the one that was there, and we redesigned it because it had to cover what all four of them, or tried to cover as much of what all four of them used to do. And so I guess the, again, the question there is, is it simply a technical issue of how you best design a route so it doesn't have the duplication problems or the others of this? If you want to provide some service to this, again, on the basis of coverage, to the west side of Santa Cruz, which is what three is about, kind of. Um, and I, I, I'm just trying to sort of grasp how, what has we done wrong or, you know, what has led to three or what we would do differently if we did want to have coverage, some coverage there. Same I, things happened up in Felton, by the way. We used to have two or three other routes that 
in, in various budget cuts, Big Lab Way, they were left with a one that's there now that we're actually considering later looking at today, uh, what we should do with it. And, and those, that's exactly a process we've been involved in. So the concept in general, we haven't, we've sort of been following the logic of what you laid out, but how you technically actually end up with a route that's rational and not the number four um, is, I think, a, is, is it a purely a technical issue? Well, four is a great example. You know, there's really very little you can do with four. <laughs> If you've decided to go into every one of those cul-de-sacs, then you're going to have a route that looks like this. And there isn't, a, there isn't a technical way that I can fix the problem presented by your land use. See? And it's really the same way with number three. Um, you know, are you going to go down into that boardwalk area or not? If you are, you're going in, turning around, coming back out, and that's going to be a, a deterrent to anyone else trying to ride through, and that's going to be an indicator of, of lousy ridership coverage service. The point is, it's even inefficient as a coverage service. It's even inefficient at providing coverage, not to mention being hopeless at providing ridership. So, um, so, so I don't want to make it appear that there are, I mean, yes, there's a certain amount of technique to this, especially where we're dealing with a landscape where the, where the street network is connected enough that we have some options, which I think is true of Watsonville, and I think is true of Live Oak Capitola to a degree. Well, when you got this, you either drive into these cul-de-sacs or you don't. And that's a very binary choice for you, <laughs> right? And if you turn, that's why I would say, if you turn the dial toward ridership, this route would disappear very quickly. And so what happens instead, what happens instead is that um, access to those social service offices that have been put in that unfortunate place becomes an issue. More people start riding their bikes up there. Um, you know, maybe, you know, you know, maybe human services organizations, for lack of a better, you know, they'll first of all come to you and try to save their services, and then, but if you make that decision, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole um, infrastructure of human services transport that might be brought into yes, some of those services. things. Um, you might have an increase in paratransit demand, although that's generally less than we expect, um, because paratransit is so limited. And we, uh, and then finally, you know, you probably get a little bit more Uber and Lyft ridership. One of the things that some transit agencies have explored is um, using, is funding a little bit of a discount for Uber and for, to use Uber and Lyft mm -hmm. into places they don't run. But honestly, that's been done only in affluent areas. It doesn't work very well for low-income areas because it's very expensive. Uber and Lyft are very inefficient, and it's very expensive to get those prices down to something that would be affordable to a low-income person. So these become very painful binary choices. You know, yeah, I mean, low-income people work in industrial jobs way out on RV West. You don't really have an alternative for them if you're not going to do this. So final um, question. The, the, the last time we made our calls, not that long ago, we decided one of the ways to look at coverage was to make sure that people could get to particular institutions. We want to make sure that our buses and Wat some of this Watsonville stuff that's left may be a, a factor or a result of saying we want to make sure our buses go to the hospital, that the buses go to the uh, big school, uh, I don't remember the other particular place it was, we're saying like a you know, government center, um, that those are places people need to get to, particularly low income people may need to get to those places. And so that was the, that was the principle on which we uh, designed some of our, our, what we understood to be pure coverage factors you can't cut this because if you can't get to the lots of the hospital, somehow there's a problem. Right. So is that a not wise way to sort of just to think about distributing the coverage, meaning that as limited as it might be, the coverage goal? Yeah. Yeah, you have to look at um, there are going to be places of severe need that are going to be impossible to reach with high range. Right. And I don't know, maybe maybe you would come back with a coverage network and say, well, we're still going to go up to the social services offices across the freeway, but we're going to go there once an hour, and that will take half a bus, and the bus will go do something else. I mean, you would start to do that, but you wouldn't turn the novel not very far toward ridership before that stuff would just be so I understand. Um, and you know, if we're talking about a big hospital, that's something else. A hospital is generally actually a ridership generator, um, if it's of any magnitude. But unfortunately, so many times we're talking about the isolated office that's, that it has a social service need, but it's been placed where the land was cheap because the access is poor, and they've essentially transferred an expense on the Yeah, he's nailed that. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Director Hagan. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I'm thinking again of 72 and 79. We have redesigned them to extend to various points. Could we take those outlying points and make them, say, three times a day, morning, noon, and night? Would that, the rest of the time of that route? Uh, That's definitely the sort of trade off you're looking at. Is that um, reasonable? Um, it is the sort of thing you would look at in the context of a redesign. If you are looking, uh, here's a typical example. You'll have a rural area or an outlying area. You know, Watsonville has this fringe, you know, Green Valley, places like that that are just kind of rural, but there are just enough people out there for it to be an issue. And often what you'll find is that the only ridership is happening in school times, or that the only ridership is happening on a couple of trips. And you can often decide based on that, look, we can't do that. Um, those of you who were around in the early 90s will remember the time that school budget cuts, that school yellow bus services were sort of demo, demolished over California and suddenly this became the transit agency's problem without any more resources to pay for it. And you know, we can, you know, that's the sort of thing you would look at, definitely. And again, if you were turning the knob, some of that stuff would disappear. But if you were just trying, but you know, certainly, if you were just trying to make a network more efficient within the, you know, within some of the current bounds, you would look at things like that. Instead. Often, we look at a low ridership route, and we find that all of its ridership is on two or three trips, and you know, there's a, there's an opportunity. Any more questions from the board? Um, any public comments? Questions? Anybody like to address us? Thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, <laughs> Being a Scotsman and having loved the film Braveheart, I just want to yell, Henry Wallace, freedom! <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Director Leopold. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in preparation for our, our business retreat in October, um, are we going to, uh, uh, are we thinking about trying to look at some of these issues, um, or have you already done some of this work with Mr. Walker to help inform of our decisions or our conversation? The, the uh, first observation is where we're at. We, this, when we're talking about a strategic plan, we would like to incorporate this kind of a philosophy into the discussion that occurs at that workshop. Um, we haven't done any work with Mr. Walker on this yet. Uh, we would have to do a contract and, and something like that might come out of the strategic retreat, if that's the direction the board wants to go, is to analyze the system. Um, I will tell you, you, you often hear speakers come up to your mic talking about frequency and the need for more frequency in certain areas. Um, from a staff perspective, we're, we love frequency, we'd like to do more frequency, but the, the challenge is this, usually the speaker is assuming that somehow you have additional money, so you'll keep everything geographically in place and add more frequency. Whereas, from a staff perspective, we know the financial constraints, and absent new money falling from the sky, we have a limited resources that then require us to do things like what Mr. Walker's talking about, reallocating those resources here within the model that we, we have. So that's the challenge, but yes, long answer to, sh to a good question. We will incorporate this discussion into the strategic uh, workshop. Yeah, and as, and as someone who's been through a, a number of cuts here, we, this is what we do, right? I mean, we we take the, the, the shrinking pool of resources and we try to make some choice, um, and whether it's conscious or not about ridership or coverage, we, we've done that a number of times. It would just be, uh, it could be helpful using this frame to, to have us think long term about where we want to be. Director Chase, are you? Yeah, I, I just want to echo that. I served on the um, operational analysis committee, and we talked a lot about this. And I was thinking about the language that we used, and Barrow led us through that. And I, we kind of we use this kind of loosely as a concept, but I think we really do, as a board, need to go straight into that and really set some either percentage standards around what we're looking for, either percentage in the coverage or the frequency, or looking at. Um, well, I think that we need some metrics on that, and I think it would be a good thing for us to do strategically and very explicitly, because that should set sort of the standard as the board moves forward. Agreed. Director Rocket. 
I just wanted to point out to our general manager that um, that money could not just fall from the sky. It could come from the decent federal government that believes in public affairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I stand corrected. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 72. We've made choices, various ones, important choices, and it's going to defeat ridership. And we've done that with 70, 79 twice now. And there's ways that we could alter 79, 72, 75, all three of them in South County. And I would think improve our ridership and maintain coverage to a certain degree. That would be a point of discussion, I'm sure, I'm sure at the retreat. Um, okay, I think, is there anyone other board member that has a comment before we move on to uh, item number 15, the uh, oral report by our CEO? Thank you, Mr. Chair, directors. Uh, several items I'll cover with you uh, as, as usual each month now I talk about, all right, tell you about new hires and promotions. We have some new hires this month. Uh, Marcos Hernandez, a paratransit operator. Andrew Crotwell, a paratransit operator. Uh, Jesse Mendoza-Garcia, paratransit operator. Sarah Crane, admin specialist. Cristobal Rivera, facilities maintenance one worker. Uh, Ezequiel Rodriguez, uh, facilities maintenance one worker. Edward Diaz, Mechanic 1, and Cesar Alvarez Castillo, Mechanic 1. Those are all new hires this month, or in the last two months actually, because recall we were dark in July. And then promotions, we have uh, Jose Carranco. He is promoted from paratransit operator to paratransit dispatch scheduler. And Holly Alcorn, promoted from senior accounting technician to accounting specialist. So a lot has happened in the last 60 days. Uh, a couple other things on my uh, agenda to talk to you about. Uh, you've probably followed some of the discussions going on in Washington, D.C. about a Senate version of the uh, transportation, housing, urban development, what they sometimes refer to as the HUD, um, and the uh, House version of that. Um, Senate version proposed to plus up, uh, that is, add more money to the bus and bus facilities program by $400 million the house version by 550 million that all would be fantastic if it happens um, but word on the street is we'll see <laughs> so, um, there was also an article uh, this last couple of weeks about um, both the house and the senate looking at the, the possible preclusion of buying chinese um, um, product with uh, federally funded money and where that would manifest itself is in BYD orders. Even though BYD, for example, has a plant they built in Antelope Valley down south to build uh, a very high U.S. content bus, um, the potential legislation, if it were to go through, uh, is less about Build America and about where the ownership is, and the ownership is in, in the Chinese, uh, in China. And so that, looking at different iterations, uh, one iteration, of course, is to preclude that from happening for one year. And, uh, and then if it happens that they don't allow you to spend federal money on that for one year, there's always the possibility that that could be renewed. So who knows where that will go. Um, that might have impacted us because we were originally looking at buying some BYD buses with uh, federal money for our over-the-road coaches. I will hold it on that right now because we're going to talk about that in a later item. And then lastly, uh, you have before you a letter of response to a letter that we received from Felipe de Leon, the Vice Chair of the Commission on Disabilities in June. You received that. Uh, that was a complaint about um, one or two individuals having gone to the Watsonville Transit Center customer service booth and found it to be closed. Um, we researched that extensively. We cannot figure out 
what this complaint might have been. They didn't give us times, dates, names, anybody to talk of to to uh, investigate this further. We we did as much investigation as we could, and uh, we're sending them back a letter just saying, gee, if you provide us some more information, maybe we could research it a little bit more. Um, we are making clear that that uh, at Watsonville Transit Center, when uh, I mean we have a, a legal duty to uh, uh, give our employees their two 15-minute breaks during the day and their lunch breaks. And so during that time, um, when we have one person staffing that booth, we put uh, sort of a clock, you know, the traditional clock on the window says back in 15 minutes or back in an hour, so the customers know that that's the case. Um, but we do have a duty to give those folks their, their breaks. So that concludes my presentation. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Okay, we'll move on to item number 16, uh, public hearing on the proposed eliminations of uh, Routes uh, 33 and 34 due to load ridership, followed by potential board action regarding elimination of those two routes. Mr. Emerson. Good morning what? again. Oh. oh, when you were open, the public hearing at 1035. Thank you. Thank you again, board chair and members. This item, as was just said, is the public hearing on the proposed elimination of routes 33 and 34 due to low ridership in fare box and low fare box recovery. As a reminder, the board opened a public comment period at its June 22nd meeting, and since then, we have received comments from seven people in one organization, the Lompico Community Center. As background, and this is really important, in 2015, Metro identified an impending $6.3 million structural deficit for a single year of FY16. Among the many tools and solutions to address that deficit was the major service reduction we did in September of 2016, where we eliminated almost 20% of the trips in the system. But we now have a balanced budget and we still exist. That's, I can't emphasize how important it is that we're still here. During the Comprehensive or Operational Analysis, or the COA as we all came to call it during that time, the service analysis uh, within that reduction plan, these two routes were the two least cost-effective routes in our entire system. But it was decided to retain them in hopes that the ridership could increase. Metro worked closely with Director McPherson and the San Lorenzo Valley School District to try to develop stronger ridership for these two routes, which the reality of us there's one trip of each in the morning, and there's one trip of each in the <coughs> afternoon, designed and scheduled to serve the SLV schools. However, we, you know, we kept the services. However, over the last two school years, the ridership has remained extremely low. And in the case of Route 33, it's actually dropped even further from two years ago on average boardings per trip. As you note, in our quarterly ridership reports to the board, we give you every quarter, including uh, the item on today's consent, calendar 12-06, attachment B1. During the last two school years, these routes have continued to have the lowest per trip ridership in our entire system. This is, this is almost shocking. The cost of providing these services is approximately $80 per trip. That's 10 times the system average. Metro would propose to continue operating these routes until the end of the fall semester at Christmas time, giving plenty of time for the school district and the local community to develop more appropriate transportation solutions to address this small scale need. Fixed route, full size buses are not the solution for all types of mobility needs. Staff recommends that the resources used for these services be reallocated to other services in the county which are in need of additional frequency and or span of service to meet demand. And just a quick sidebar since our annual report was on the consent calendar day, our system is such that we probably in many cases don't have a minimal span of service that covers a 10 to 12 hour period that allows people to get to jobs and places. So although we absolutely need frequency, some of our system needs a bump up in span of service. The last bus being at 5.30 or 4.30 on a Saturday afternoon to Live Oak, that's not a transportation alternative. So as noted in the Annual Planning Department Status Report and sent out in 12-10, pending the outcome of Proposition 6 in November, the intent would be to reallocate these resources 
in expansion of the Route 35 and 35A in the San Lorenzo Scotts Valley area. And just to remind ourselves, per board direction, we have 160 some bus operators. And your commitment in the budget this last year, let's add one more this year and one more next year. That's one 160th. So that speaks to Alex's context on how much capacity we have to fix our system. As we all know, we put that new position on hold till we see what happens with Prop 6. So that's kind of the box we're in. Moving on, per Title 6, this proposed service elimination does not have a disparate com impact on minority populations. In terms of paracruise, there are three patrons who access paracruise for whom the service could be eliminated. However, staff believes this could be mitigated in some cases because the Route 35 is operating in the vicinity and it may be possible for some individuals to arrange a point of origin or drop off within three quarters of a mile of Route 35. And this is done quite a lot in the paracruise system. People's home or office or destination is slightly outside. They get to a point within three quarters and we pick them up and deliver them. So that's the end of my introduction of this item and I'll wait next steps. Okay, um, we, uh, this is a difficult situation for me in particular, but uh, is there any comments by the board before we open up? A couple public? questions. Yes, Mr. Bob. A couple questions for you. Yes, sir. Explain to me, when you mentioned the $80 per trip, is that, how does that relate to another route? Is that per person? Or how, okay. First of all, our average cost per trip in the system is $8 passenger go well, wrong with their two dollar fare that gets it to the cost of ten dollars to operate a trip but the two dollar fare gets it date so we took the number of hours operated on these two services during a year multiplied them by the two hundred dollars that it costs to run a bus for an hour and divided by the number of boardings in a year which is about 23 or 2400 comes out to eighty dollars Per person, per, person, per trip. Sorry if I didn't say that. that. That's okay. And the other thing is, is, is there a, a cost re associated with the Route 33 and 34, general cost to run those routes? $200,000 in a year. It's, yeah, yes. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Any, uh, anyone from the public who would like to address us on this topic? Yes, sir. Uh, Uh, my name is William Chaser. I'm a Lompico resident. Uh, I've been there 35 years. And I found out about the uh, 33 might be just 33 and 34 might be discontinued from a bus driver. Uh, I might, it's possible I might have seen the notice at the, at the Scotts Valley Transit Center, but how I found out about it was from a, a bus driver who I had conversations with. I think it would have been better to open the uh, public comment period by starting it when the bus was running. Uh, maybe just putting a, a piece of paper, a little piece of paper in there, so they, you know, the people who ride it, would know this was happening. And so I informed all my friends, people in the community, that this was happening. That's probably why you have public comment. So anyway, that's just a, a, how I found out about it. I do want to say that I really like the Metro. I enjoy riding the bus. It's my means of transportation. I wrote a letter telling my personal situation, how I, how I use it, what I do. You may have that in your file, so yeah, we'll talk about that. Uh, I think... We should look at it this way. We have one bus, drives to Felton, does the 33 route, comes back, does the 34 route, and then drives back to Santa Cruz. The 33 bus is used a lot. I, I've ridden it for four years now. And a couple of years ago, just like the gentleman was saying, I'd get on that bus sometimes and it'd be full of kids. Just absolutely kids standing in there. 
Last couple of years, it's dropped off a little bit. Uh, this year, I, I, I wrote it on Monday when it started. There were seven people on the bus. Uh, that was the first day of school, seven people. And um, I think that is a fair number for what, what we're looking at here, because the bus goes up Quail Hollow, there's neighborhoods there, goes into Long Pico, comes back out, goes to Zianni, then goes down West Zianni. That bus serves, if you need a piece of, you need to get somewhere on a bus, that's the only one that gets us there. And so it's important for that, everything to the east of Highway 9. Now, if we could take Long Pico and Zianni and move it over next to Highway 9, we wouldn't have a problem. But we got to send a bus. So that's the way it is. And I, it's really important to the people who do need that bus that we have it, even though it's a very limited service. Like, if I got to go somewhere, if I got to go to San Jose or do something like that, I get up early, walk down, almost dark, get dark in the morning, get on the 7 o'clock bus, and then my day gets started. So, anyway, it's important to us. And your decision is going to affect me for a long time. And all the kids who ride it, everybody who will ever use that bus, if it's not there, we, we don't have a bus. I could afford to go buy a car. When I retired, I didn't want to drive anything. I said, I'm tired of driving. I drove for a living. I said, I'm going to take the bus. And I am so glad I did. My life is so less stressful. So anyway, that's why I take the bus. So I broke the numbers down. This gentleman gave some figures. I heard one time from a bus driver that it was $100 per hour to run a bus. So that was the number I used. And I calculated out the time at 100 bucks an hour divided by 60, that's $1.67 a minute, times the number of minutes per ride. Comes out for, um, but for the, to run the bus, the 33 bus, it's time to, <laughs> uh, anyway. Uh, Thank you. I figured out that the, the using a 23% fare box recovery rate would be seven seven people on the bus. That's exactly what it was on the bus. The 34, I've never ridden it. I've never go to that part of town. I can't speak to it. All I know is it costs you money. If you break it down, the cost is the cost to run that bus per hour breaks down for the whole. The entire thing, going from the 33, 34, and back to Santa Cruz. The 33 is 39% of it. The 34 is 30% of it. And the cost to get that bus to go from here to Safeway in, in Felton Fair and then come back, that's another 30%. The 30% of the cost is just getting the bus to that starting spot. So I, if you break it down, like I said, I'm learning about the 34, the people who write it, how many people. If you're going to eliminate something, I'd say eliminate 34 from a business standpoint. Because there's, they, they say there's two people that write in the morning, nobody in the afternoon. No sense in sending a bus somewhere over the way. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the public? Jones and I'm the president of the Long Pico Community Center and there's a letter in the packet that the board of directors wrote on behalf of our membership so I won't go over that. I did take some notes while I was listening to the gentleman's presentation and I the, the biggest point I got out of his presentation and what's happening with the bus staff right now is it doesn't sound like to me that you have decided if you're going to go ridership versus coverage. So I, I think maybe you should think about what your goal is going to be before you start cutting services. The other thing I want to say is it is not feasible 
for anyone in Lompico to get three quarters of a mile to the near to Felton without walking on the side of the road with no sidewalk. It's very dangerous. I can't see any of our kids, senior citizens, walking down the side of the road to get within three quarters of a mile of Felton. Um, and you talked about choices, but Lompico really has no other choice. Uber and Lyft tend to not want to come out there, and the people that are riding the bus can't afford Uber and Lyft, and or they're too young, they're under 18. So, um, I don't know, I just don't see any alternative for the people in Lompico. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? Morning. Um, cutting minimum 33 to 34 is a bad idea. I think that saying that it's not a disadvantaged community is incorrect. Anywhere out of Santa Cruz County is a disadvantaged community, expected to live here. We pick up all the students. Today I drove it, had about nine students. Um, and you probably get more in the afternoon when they don't want to get home. So take that into consideration. You're taking an opportunity for kids to go to school. So I'm going to have a fair sometimes. You have them right. Um, just the rural area, you can't walk. You know, walk doesn't take you an hour from a district anyway. Um, Lips is not going to go up there. Uber is not going to go up there. You know, just take that into consideration before you guys make any cuts. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else from the public who would like to address this, this issue? Okay. Close the public hearing. Bring it back to the board. <coughs> I, want, I want to thank the people who uh, took the time to come down and um, share their concerns about this issue. When, when we made our cuts um, last time, um, this at that time, this was recognized, these two routes were recognized to be the least productive in the, in the system and made a hard choice. Um, the board voted to, to maintain them and see if we couldn't find a way to build the service and maybe we could save them if enough people got on the routes to make them productive enough to, to support. But that really hasn't happened. Uh, with all due respect to the people that spoke, and I, I take quite, it's not an easy decision, I take quite seriously their concerns. Um, to be told that it's $80 a rider suggests, with, you know, and I only say this not as a serious suggestion, but to be point out the absurdity of the choice we're being offered, it'd be cheaper to buy each of the people riding in a car or to like uh, pay them for Uber service or something else, because at 80 bucks, Ride. I mean, it's it's a level that's just way beyond our ability to sort of maintain a service. So, um, it's I have to say I, I don't do this easily. I'm not excited to do it. You never want to cut service to anybody, but I will make a motion that we um, accept the recommendation that we cut these routes um, because they're just so unproductive that we really cannot continue to to end up supporting them. It does have a negative impact on people. I think we recognize that. But again, it was a larger group when we did it, but when we made the cuts before, we had, at that point, scores if not hundreds of people who were being similarly disadvantaged and we still made the hard decisions to cut those in order to maintain the routes that actually will provide a lot more service for more people and that's a hard choice. But that, that's my motion that we accept this report and end up cutting these routes. Second. Second uh, by, uh, motion by Brian Kinto. I'm happy to do so. I know. Uh, Mr. Mr. Bothrop, do you have a comment? I, I just had a question. Um, I'm, I'm trying to go back in my mind. When we were talking about these bus routes, was there some, I was looking through the report, but I didn't see Oh, I'm sorry. That I had. Okay. Some law, some guideline about um, us in conflict with school districts not being able to provide a route that provides uh, school service. Can you just refresh my memory on that? There, there is a, a federal regulation that we can't, uh, we can't compete with uh, bus services, contracted bus services in particular, I think, that provide uh, school service. This is not um, a direct conflict because it is a fixed route that is an open door. Um, the reality is uh, the, the riders tend to be some students. And I think as Barrow probably pointed out, um, in this two years that have passed, we, we've met with the folks at the school district um, tried to see if they would do something like what we do with UCSC and Cabrillo, which is subsidize us to keep it running. And they said, well, no, why would we do that? Your cost is way higher than it would cost us to contract for yellow bus service. And, and so we got our answer there, and that ultimately led to this discussion today. But, but the short answer to yours is no, there is no direct. Uh, we investigated it since 
Um, I think I made that comment a couple of years ago, or a couple of months ago. Uh, but there's no direct um, violation, we think, of the, the federal law. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the board. I know I really worked hard uh, almost two years ago to keep this uh, service, and uh, we've been trying to see what we can do to keep it uh, or have it become more productive, uh, which has not happened. And uh, although we're focusing on an isolated incident here of two routes, uh, I can't. In our consolidation reduction effort, you know, we reduced 20%, I think, of the, the structure that we had, and we kept this whole. Uh, so I'm appreciative of uh, the board going along with that to see how we can make this work better. Unfortunately, it has not uh, approved uh, to any degree. Um, and uh, reluctantly, I think each of us is going to, uh, well, I don't, I'm going to vote uh, to support the motion under the circumstances. And I think that uh, this, can be, this will be a part of a further discussion when we uh, have our retreat in October. I know that as well. So. Um, if uh, there's not any more any more comments from the board, uh, Mr. Botrick, did you have any comments? No, I, I, I thought we were going to get ready to vote. Sorry, Mr. Chair, just, just for the record, do you have in your packet, uh, in the attachments, uh, letters that we want to make sure that, that are included in the record from, um, from customers and others? And then we've also dropped under desk today some late arrivals that we're including in the record. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about that because the gentleman came up and said, well, I wrote a letter, but we can't tell any names of anybody who wrote. I, I understand not including addresses and everything, mm -hmm. but not including names just seems... I can include the names. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, they're entering something into the public record. I'm, I, I haven't seen, seen a practice of, of exiting out any of it, but I understand if we don't want people's address, but... Knowing who the writers are, it, it does make a difference. So I'll correct the online version, and then um, do you want me to send you two versions? Well, I just think in the future, in the future, it would be helpful not to have that xed out uh, or blocked out. I think it's 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 helpful for me to know who it is, or if I uh, uh, see con uh, uh, constituents to know. Oh, yeah. Will said something. You know, wrote something. That's I, I know I got his letter. Okay. Good, good, good thing. And, and we'll also, but we will delete the uh, email address on the one that we got today. But I do want to emphasize. Yeah, you would be your You're own. You're good. You're on. I do want to emphasize that we, uh, <coughs> no, I told myself wrong, and that that we did get those letters, and and they're heart rending, and it's like you understand that this people are not making this up, that there's a negative impact, and we shouldn't fool ourselves that somehow this is going to go down easily or doesn't negatively impact people. It does, and that's one of the hard things of being in the seat. Yeah. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Second, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. The public hearing is closed. Yeah. The public hearing is closed, and we will move, move on to item number 17, which is the next public hearing award of contract for the Metro Facilities Lighting Retrofit Project. Paid uh, 
monthly and then monthly installments uh, and being paid off approximately uh, three uh, in three and a half years at zero percent interest. Uh, after conducting a after we conduct a public hearing and making recommendations for finding Senate Metro is author uh, to authorize to enter into an, an emergency service contract with the uh, government, uh, with our contract per government code section 4217.10. So you may want to speak to that one. Your voice. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, just quickly, uh, under Metro's you're not name, you're not on. Oh, I'm not on. Okay, here we go. Red light. Red light. Uh, under Metro's enabling legislation for public works contracts, you're required to um, let, uh, you know, according to the low bid process. Uh, but the legislature has made an exception for energy savings contracts. So um, part of that exception is we have to have a public hearing and the board has to make specific findings. So that's exactly what this does. And when you make your motion, those findings are part of that. And, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just really a formality. And um, otherwise, it's, uh, it's in front of you in the report. But that's why we're doing the, the hearing. Comments? This is uh, yeah, Director Leopold. Um, uh, 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 given the experience of the county, I would be prepared to that you we will get uh, we may get some complaints about the brightness of the light, um, uh, and that you should be prepared to put some shields on it. That, that, that this has happened in some street lights uh, in, in the county, and I don't know whether it'll happen here given the locations. But uh, uh, our experience is that sometimes people complain about the change in the lighting. So just be prepared. Any other comments from the board? Okay, we'll open the public hearing. Is there any one in the public who would like to comment on this item? Okay, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Director Rockin. It's kind of hard to imagine the argument against this. Uh, it's environmentally sound and it saves us money and gets yeah. paid off in three years. So I will move that we adopt the recommendation, including the findings. Second. Okay, move, right. Moved and seconded. And we accept the uh, recommendation. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Uh, item number 18 to uh, uh, act on the selection of replacement for the Santa Cruz Metro Board Vice Chair. I'm very sorry, uh, but understanding uh, that our Vice Chair, Cynthia Chase, will not be running for re-election for the City Council, so she uh, will be uh, not be a member of the Metro Board in the near future. And uh, we'd like to have some comments from, from this uh, Director Chase. Yes, thank you. So um, I am still serving all the rest of my term, but I did uh, want to allow a new vice chair to have the opportunity to prepare, hopefully, for being chair the following year. And it just seemed right to step down and to allow that person um, to have an opportunity to do that. So I am um, hoping you'll accept my resignation as vice chair. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, still, no, although... no, no, no. <laughs> But I'm still here through the end of my term, uh, and I might show up in the public. There's actually a high, a high chance that I will. Um, but I would actually also like today uh, the board to consider um, my nomination of um, Ed Bottorf as the vice chair to replace me. And that's all I can say on that. Does that suggest a motion? Yeah. So I'd like to make a motion. Um, that uh, you, the board accept my resignation as vice chair and accept the nomination of Ed Bachberg to replace me. Second. We move and second it. Uh, Director Leopold. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, thank you to Director Chase for, uh, uh, for being uh, thoughtful in terms of trying to find this. And uh, Mr. Bachberg is an is excellent uh, choice, and I strongly support it. I had a question, though, for our council about uh, uh, Director Chase. She is a representative of the city of Santa Cruz. Um, so she's appointed by the city of Santa Cruz, and she's appointed until they appoint someone else. Correct. So even if, she, even if her term ends, she's still, she's still uh, a city representative or appointed by the city. Yeah, so um, this has come up. <laughs> 
in the past when you have an outgoing council member um, and you don't have the new one appointed yet, you actually do not benefit from their membership on this board because you have a funky provision in your enabling legislation that says their, their service on this board ends when their service on their appointing body ends. It's one of the things we're talking about getting a legislative fix for. Other transit districts ha don't have that. It says their service continues until the new member is seated. So we want to fix that. Yeah. But right now, we'll, we'll have a whole. So even if the city took action, there's no way, there's no way to do that. Well, the city so if the city action, takes but action. Don't. But they don't until January or February. Yeah. Uh, Director Matthews. So that requires a legislative fix and not an internal fix? Correct, because it's in your your state legislation, in your enabling legislation, in the transit district law. I do remember when this happened, yep. actually. <laughs> it happens every year. Well, but when it's really specifically. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll fix it. I mean, it's on our agenda, hopefully, to, to find a sponsor and, and get that corrected. What do we anticipate the timeline is for that? Next year. Unfortunately, yeah, post, post chase, the post chase era, yeah. <laughs> as opposed to post chase. We'll name the legislation. Okay, then. Uh, any other comments from the board? Um, well, having not accepted uh, by certifications, uh, no. Uh, having recommended that Ed Bothorf uh, be named vice chair of the Metro Transit District, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Thank you. Oh, excuse me. I um, is there any other member of the public that wanted to speak in that? Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we will go to item number 19 to approve, approve consideration of uh, author, authorizing the CEO to execute a second contract amendment with uh, CPS for uh, HR consulting to increase the contract total by $60,688 for an SEIU classification and compensation study. Um, Angela Aiden, our human sources director, CEO. Good morning. Yep, or CFO. Oh, and your interim charger. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. 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 <laughs> so uh, back in 2016, November 2016, we went out to public and with an RIP to get a class and comp for management as well as SEIU. And then in May of 17, um, that was um, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, we have set March of 17, it came back at CPS as our contractor. So then in May of 17, we had a side agreement put together with SEIU where they agreed to um, have this uh, class and comp done for SEIU by December 2018, December 31st of 2018. Um, today, we're asking that you do the amendment to the CPS contract. Uh, we are almost done with the management. I am trying really hard to get it to you by September. October would be the latest, but September is what we're going for. And in the meantime, we're also going to be starting um, SEIU next week, if this is approved today, to start that process with them next week. So um, we have some timelines that we're putting together, some ground rules that we're going to be putting together. Um, right now, I'm looking at about 80 plus positions that we need to review with SEIU. Uh, there are different ways that we can. Oh, your mic went off. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. There are different ways we can uh, uh, approach those positions. And so I've had some um, initial talks with SCIU, but we're going to be starting our official review of the positions and going down the class and comp with them uh, next Thursday. I have been in contact with Jennifer, some of you may remember Jennifer, who presented when we first started the management comp plan. Her and I are going to be the team leads on each side to make sure that this goes as smoothly as possible and that everything is taken into consideration as we go. So today I'm asking for the board to approve the uh, second amendment to the contract for first CPS so that we can move forward with SEIU. Okay, thank you. Any comments from the board? Uh, Director Rockin. I think we originally thought that the uh, management study would be done a lot quicker than it was, and we had obviously issues among others losing the HR director. Um, so it makes sense to advance this now so we can actually meet our commitment to SEIU and try and get this thing done in a timely fashion. So I'm going to wait for public comments, but I, I, I support doing this. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, Rick Matthews, you're, you want to comment? No, okay, you're okay? No. Okay, I, I'll uh, open it to the public. Is there any comments from the public on item number 19? Okay, 
bring the issue back to the board. Move approval of the recommendation. Second. Second. Uh, moved by Rockton, seconded by Matthews that uh, we approve the contract. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered. Uh, now we have um, consideration of a resolution of proposing Proposition 6, which would repeal Senate Bill 1, which is vital to the operations of Metro and any transit district, or anybody who drives a car or a vehicle or drives a bike or does anything. Does anyone in existence uh, anywhere? Yeah, I've never seen <laughs> uh, So, so um, our CEO, Alec Clifford, will comment on that. Sure, I, I, I think this is uh, your one get out of jail free card to pass a resolution in opposition to Proposition uh, 6. As, as you know, we, from here on in, we'll, we'll need to uh, be very mindful of talking in terms of educating the voters about what will happen in the event that Prop 6 passes, but you're allowed to actually do a resolution at this point, as are many other transit properties and, and other legislative bodies across the state. Um, I, I will tell you that we will participate and, and are participating in a countywide uh, series of meetings to develop our strategy countywide, public works directors, CAO, um, city managers, on how we will sort of pool our resources to educate the public between now and, the, and November about what the consequences are of Proposition 6 passing. Uh, and as you already know, we, we celebrated the arrival of new equipment uh, that was uh, jointly funded by proposition by uh, SB1, sorry, and, and uh, also Measure D, and then that led to our last headways having a cover page and an article inside about how important um, SB1 and Measure D are to funding equipment that we desperately need to replace. And then you have at your uh, desk. The next version that will hit any day now, uh, as we get closer to the next fall service change, in which we talk again about the uh, consequences of uh, Proposition 6 passing and what that will mean to us. And on the inside of the cover will be a, a story about that. So that's only the beginning. We'll, we'll keep ramping it up. Um, and, and again, obviously participating in the countywide effort to educate. Uh, but this is your opportunity now to to speak to the folks that are in the audience, speak to the folks that are watching on TV, hopefully many are, and um, tell them what you think about it and how important this is to us. Thank you. Uh, Director Rockton. I'm sorry to prepare you for this question, but could you give us sort of an order of magnitude statement about what would happen to our budget if, S, if uh, Prop 6 were to pass? Yes, that's in the report. It's $2.4 million. $2.4 million impact. Um, and and if out of a total budget of out of a total budget of fifty million dollars, and so um, you know Measure D and SB one have allowed you now for the for the first time in a very long time to not only stabilize services but to dedicate uh, nearly three million dollars to capital, which we're using to leverage against state and federal money in order to try to begin. The process of chipping away at the big old iceberg of 62 buses that need to be replaced. Uh, if this passes, we'll have to come back to you in short order and you'll have some tough decisions to make um, because it's probably not as easy as just saying, well, we just won't buy buses. I really I think it's not that easy. And so this will be a very difficult series of discussions for you to have to figure out how to rebalance our budget in the event that the voters approve Proposition 6. Yeah, I think it's uh, in general too uh, that one of your bullet points is that it, it's projected to provide uh, approximately twenty million dollars for road maintenance, public transit, priority regional transportation projects in San Francisco County. So uh, we can see that there have been a lot of projects recently that have been uh, up and running, so to speak. And uh, without this, it's not going to happen, or it's going to take a lot long, longer time to get uh, accomplished. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you point out that this is a, SB1 has been a huge lifeline uh, to the metro, uh, to the county road system, which would look about, a, about an $8 million loss. Um, so if, if you care about transportation in Santa Cruz County, uh, it's critical that the, that the legislature raise the gas tax for the first time since 1993. 
Um, it, it's a sound way of getting the people who use the road to pay for the roads um, and pay for the services that are on the road. And um, it's, it's a cynical attempt by congressional Republicans to increase turnout to try to save congressional Republican seats in Southern California. It's a terrible uh, way to make policy. It's a stupid way to, 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 uh, to work against funding uh, what's a critical piece of infrastructure in Santa Cruz County and in California. And when you can get uh, local government, uh, organized labor, and the Chamber of Commerce to all agree on the same thing, you should listen to them, and they're all against Proposition 6, so I'm glad that we'll be joining them. Next official, Member Thomas, UCS. Uh, Alex, you had spoken on a number, a group of people that would, you will work with kind of pull resources together and see how you can like, educate the public. Who exactly like are in that, your potential group that you spoke of? Yes, yeah, so we had our first meeting this week. As you may recall, I initially said that I'd be pulling that meeting together. Um, we've now transferred that responsibility over to the RTC, which makes better sense, plus they have a communications person, and we don't, so that really helps. So that, that group has been pulled together. It's, uh, this, again, the CAO, city managers, public works directors, and, and of course we're at the table to strategize on how we will jointly invest our resources in the coming months to educate the voters about the consequences of Proposition 6. Is there any UCSC representation there? There are 17,000 students in the city, so we are a good vote. Right. We can add that, Vero. Uh, do, would you mind communicating that to the RTC? I think that's a great really suggestion. Important. Larry's right there. He's right there behind <laughs> us. So I, 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 I always, always advocate for Larry to be involved in these conversations. I am Perfect. surely certain that students will be in favor of like working with y'all on this. So I would definitely advise for including UC Santa Cruz in these discussions. Perfect. And Cabrillo, no doubt. Also. Yeah, Cabrillo as well, Zach. Thank you. Okay. Good, good suggestion. Thank you. Uh, Director Matthews. Yeah. My, yeah, my yeah. questions were along those same lines. Um, so the RTC is taking the lead. It would be great if you could get us the actual contact person. And if they have a, um, a website or a link on their website specific to this, um, issue and I understand the difference between education and advocacy and I think it's on the uh, on the charge of all of us and everyone we can think of to pull them onto the advocacy side of this. Um, I presented last night to one group and it's on our council agenda and so I think everyone here, I think they're probably doing that, making sure that a similar action is taken to their group. I can think of SUA and Cabrillo, for example. Um, it would be, uh, certainly in terms of the advocacy part of this, the Measure D campaign was a model. And to, do you know to what extent someone's picking up the ball on a coordinated advocacy effort? Um, I, I will say I got some really good material from League of California Cities mm -hmm. on the impact to Santa Cruz County, just listed specifically what's at risk, and I think that kind of speaks to um, making a pitch to whoever group it is, but I'm thinking, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping all the unions are putting this on their agenda, all the writer groups we can think of, et cetera, et cetera. And again, I understand the difference between education and advocacy, but it's an all-out press, and you said all bullet points. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I just, Agreed. you know, we're a little county, but we can deliver some votes. So. You know, I think there one thing uh, to be uh, yeah. clarified too. Uh, the state in the past has had a habit of taking transfer, stealing the transportation funds and putting it into different agencies. Uh, there was a measure on the June ballot that would yeah. prohibit that specifically, so that that revenue funds uh, meant for transportation stay in transportation. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important issue, uh, part of this uh, discussion. If you happen to, because some people might have heard, well, they've stolen from the transportation pocket before. Uh, that's not allowed in the state now. So that's part of the education, though, mm -hmm. part. That's I think there's still a lot of people that are confused about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, so that's a really point that needs to be made. That, because yes. that's been a big criticism in the past. And now, Use your microphone. So, I thought I'd take it <laughs> <laughs> Not to be picked up on TV. Yeah. It's been a problem, I think, in the past that people have objected to to these kinds of, of, of funding mechanisms uh, because the money was not actually going for what they were voting for. And now we have, with that passage of that proposition, 
that is no longer the issue. But I'm not sure that everybody has gotten that message. Yeah, I think then that's why it's important to make it part of your educational discussion. Um, we have, uh, did we have a motion on it, or was there a public comment on this? Uh, any, any comments from the public? Hi, Joan Jeffries, uh, SEIU. I just wanted to say that um, we, the unions, were a part of the, prop, the Measure D effort, and we certainly also want to be a part of, of this effort to, to say no to Prop 6. We've, uh, chapter leaders have reached out to our CEO. Uh, we want to coordinate efforts and um, get out there and help spread the word about this and help try and convince voters. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Director Matthews? And, and just again, thank you for that. And, and to your point, when you look at the, uh, I think it's six pages of groups that are already signed on uh, in opposition to the top six, there are the statewide organizations, but then there's all the little local chapters. And so that's part of just reaching the numbers is even if your, if your state organization has signed on, have your local <coughs> chapter educate and take action as well. All right. Thank you. Uh, Director Hagan? Yes, John mentioned how the money that's gone into the structure of rebuilding roads and highway. We need to maintain it from my point of view, sidewalks, asphalt walkways. You have no idea how many times I have to go down and back up a two or three blocks and get out of the bike lane and get back down to where I was. Yeah. That infrastructure for us in the wheelchair group is critical. I can't tell you how many times. I do, I do just want to add to this. As I drove here comfortably in my own car, I saw you in your wheelchair coming out <laughs> from, I don't know where you originated, but I thought, boy, that is determination. Yeah, and I appreciate you've got to have a, a clear passage. All right. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Director Rockman, move approval of the resolution in uh, this board in opposition to Proposition 6 on the November ballot. Second. Moved by Rockton, seconded by Leopold to, uh, for the board to oppose Proposition 6 on the November ballot. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So ordered unanimously. Okay. I'm number. Bruce, yes. I, if I could just add, Alex, I think if you could, as this goes on, distribute to um, both the um, board members and uh, other interested parties whatever informational pieces you get, because we only need once a month. And that will just help us keep current and keep it live. Yeah, I, I certainly will do that. And, and the beauty of what we discussed this week at, in the RTC forum is that, you know, sort of FAQs and, and other kinds of pieces of information that will be useful to all of us in the various forums, yeah, including a part of the plan would be for, for some of us to identify key people, whether it's us or elected officials or otherwise, um, to go on radio talk shows and all kinds of other other opportunities where we can get the word out. Um, you know, our, our county voters can help compensate for other counties in which the swing might be the other way. So we really need our folks to vote for this and go for 100% against. And again, if you could give us the contact person and we have questions, Certainly. it doesn't have to be circuitous. Certainly. We'll move on to uh, item number 21. Uh, to. Uh, uh, to discuss uh, the 2016 low or non-emission grant preservation request, approval of a letter to the Federal Transit Administration Region Number 9. Mr. Clifford. Yes. So this is uh, uh, related to our 2016 Federal low no grant that we received, $3.8 million combined with local match over $4 million. This is no small sum of money. Uh, and you recall, in 2016, we received one of the highest awards in the nation. We got a higher award than, than uh, Chicago, Illinois got, so that's pretty substantial. They can talk and, to you about uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> they, they won't be back. <laughs> uh, I <don't> <laughs> writing that grant, we partnered with BYD, and at that time, BYD had not produced a zero emissions over the road coach, but they said, we have one coming, it's timely for this grant, and we talked about our needs, which were 
um, horsepower uh, and, and uh, capacity, and they said, hey, we, we can do that, and we want this thing to be able to do uh, a certain number of trips over the hill and back before it has to be recharged, because we were worried about that and what the hill might, might uh, the mountain, I guess I should say, might do to the draw of power on the bus. So then, fast forward, um, it wasn't until late 2017 they finally produced the prototype. The prototype bus was brought here, it performed miserably, uh, although it, it did seem to meet our needs for uh, recharging, that is, it would make two round trips over the hill before needing to recharge. Um, even that is a little bit suspect because that's today, that's not life of battery. Life of battery means what does it, what is it capable of doing 12 years from now because batteries degrade over time. Um, so that still had to be taken into consideration. But the biggest failure was that it couldn't meet our power requirements. It could not keep up the traffic. It could not do speed limits. It could barely do a little bit better than our compressed natural gas buses are doing. Um, and so we, we try to go back to BYD and say, hey, um, what are you going to do about this? What's your plan? What, what, what are our options? And they really just sort of told Aaron, um, gee, we don't have anything really to offer you right now, but in a couple of years we might. And that really was not worth the paper it wasn't written on to us. So at that point, we decided it was time to reach out to the federal government and let them know that there's a potential problem here uh, and to begin our effort to do everything possible to ensure that we keep that money that doesn't leave this region um, as a result of our partnership with BYD. Um, so we, we met with the local um, um, regional office in San Francisco with the acting uh, administrator. Um, talked through some strategies. We then rolled that a couple weeks later into our board visit. Mr. Rodkin, Mr. Bottrop will recall uh, our board visit. Uh, Mr. Dutra was there also. Uh, we, in April, we went to Washington, D.C. to do our annual event of working our way through the halls to talk about things that are important to transit, but we went to the FTA to talk to them about this specifically. Um, well, in addition to the fact that we want them to keep looking favorably upon us for future funding, because we have a lot of buses to replace. And we, we made two proposals. Uh, well, we made, we, at that time, you might recall, we had a, pre we had a previous discussion about um, maybe buying low emission diesel buses for Highway 17. And so we presented them a proposal. Low emission diesel, these new low emission diesel buses qualify under the low and no program. So we presented that to the FTA. Um, and they kind of looked down at the table, not very enthusiastic about that proposal. But we talked to them about, well, what about another proposal in which we take this money and move it over to zero emission bus fixed route? And they seemed a little bit more enthusiastic about that. They said, go back and make a, a proposal. We went back, we took zero emission, uh, uh, I'm sorry, low emission diesels off the table, came up with that proposal as our primary with a fallback proposal, which uh, will stay committed to over-the-road coaches, um, but we, uh, we can't buy them until another manufacturer enters the market. So we had a primary and a fallback in the revised approach. Went back to San Francisco as a team, uh, Ciro, Barrow, Aaron, and I went, um, pitched that hard to the acting administrator and his team, and he said, um, gee, we don't like your primary proposal, but we like your secondary proposal. Um, and he pointed out that one of the reasons why you not only won this grant, but one of the reasons why you won such a significant amount of money is because of the inner city approach you were taking, you know, connecting Santa Cruz County to Santa Clara Valley, uh, Santa Clara County, and uh, because it was on a commuter line and it was over the road coach. So those all factored in. And so if they allowed us to move the money over to fixed route, uh, they felt that they would have sort of a cardinal change in the program and the original award, and that could make the whole thing suspect. So they said, we like your second plan. And so what we'll do is we'll cap your money, um, not let you spend any more of it. We'll hold it there for you. We won't let you spend it other than you're allowed to continue to build the electrical recharging infrastructure that you need to build over at the yard. So they'll let us, over the next two years, continue to draw down on that grant to build the electrical infrastructure for the buses, because that's the lead time. That's the long pole in the tent, which is you got to get your electrical infrastructure in place before your buses arrive. And they take longer. It takes longer to build that infrastructure than to build the buses. So they'll let us do that. And then over the course of the next year or two, we'll be watchful 
of other vendors entering the market. Now, MCI has already said they are developing a bus. As a matter of fact, we sent a team up north to meet with them this week to give them our feedback on what that bus needs to include in order to serve our purposes. So the nice thing about MCI is they're reaching out before they, they put everything on paper and say, this is what we're gonna build. They're reaching out to us and saying, what do we need to build for you? And, and they talked about the range and they talked about the horsepower. So that bus could potentially be here in another year or so with a prototype. So once a prototype is developed, and maybe Van Hool and some of the others will have one at that time, um, but we'll test those prototypes. We'll be as cautious as we were with BYD. And once that bus gets here, we'll test it. If it's right, then we'll put out a competitive procurement. So the FTA is allowing us to abandon the commitment of the partnership with BYD and go with a competitive procurement and, and then, uh, and then uh, make that award and keep our money. The reason why, I, you might say, well, that sounds like a no-brainer. Why is this here before us? The reason why it's here is I needed to make sure that you were aware of one one important caveat in this, and that is that the FTA said, if we approve it, now I have to send this letter to them, they still have to approve it, but if we approve it, and later on in a year or two years, it costs more money to buy three over-the-road coaches, you, Metro, have to commit to coming up with the difference in order to still buy three over-the-road coaches. So if it costs 100000 more, 200000 more, I'll have to come back to you and get authorization for more money. I'm here to tell you I think that's a good gamble. It's a good gamble to risk an, an incremental, more incrementally more expensive bus two years from now than to give up $3.8 million. So if that's the recommendation. I ask that you approve that and allow me to transmit yeah, the letter to the FTA. Thank you for uh, you know, simplifying what this, uh, a complicated situation or has been made so, but I think this is, a, is worth the, the gamble, and I don't think it's a gamble at all. I think it's just a great opportunity. Uh, Director Rocky. Are there any questions about whether the uh, electrical infrastructure we put in place will be appropriate and work with whatever's designed a uh, year from now or yeah. years from now? We, we certainly do have those concerns. So, um, you know, that I think to the point of, the, of building the infrastructure to get the electricity from, say, the pole of the property line yeah, down, transformer, all yeah. of that should be pretty good. We're designing that to have uh, room, uh, sufficient capacity to charge 10 buses. So I think we're going to be okay there in the way that we're working that out. It, it really, I think, and Aaron, I'm going to let you jump up if I get any of this wrong, uh, but I think the problem really is on the other side of the transformer where we distribute that to the charger itself. Yeah, whether it's an and, and so that we don't know what that looks like, and, and we don't know if MCI will build an inductive charger, uh, which would be important to us because the way we envision operating this is say you do two round trips over the hill, and then you lay over at Pacific Station for say 10 to 15 minutes and start boosting up the power and then probably every run thereafter the rest of the day, the layover time becomes recharging time and that allows the bus to make it through the rest of the day. We don't know if they're going to build inductive charge. So there's still some things to work out. Director Matthews? I think it was the same question. I, uh, and I feel like it's technologically stupid, but the, I think the question is, is it a universal connection for, for every good. single electric manufacturer at this point has yeah. some different there, there is not and that is part of the problem the industry is talking about okay. is standardization of mm -hmm. exactly that uh, and then there's there's the, there's the chargers which um, you know the larger the capacity of the charger the quicker it will charge the bus mm -hmm. and so we kind of want to stay on top of that and get the most current thing a couple of years from now because maybe Today's charger takes four hours throughout the night to charge, but maybe tomorrow's will take two. That's important to us because as we start incrementally growing our transition into electric buses and head towards 100 electric buses, which once the CARB regulation comes into place, we will have to do. Remember, after 2029, we'll have to buy everything we buy as electric buses um, when that regulation passes. So we, we just need to make sure that when you start thinking through, gee, your last buses come back to the yard, let's call it, say, 10 o'clock at night, your first ones roll out at, you know, 4 in the morning, you've only got so many hours to charge those buses, and, and you can't charge them all at one time, so you have to roll through the fleet and be able to charge them. So the quicker they charge, the, the better chances we'll have that we can get through 100 buses. Now, this is just 100 bus. Imagine when you're talking a place like Chicago. Los Angeles, Chicago, <laughs> <laughs> where you have you know 
two, three times as many buses as we have in a yard to charge. This is this is a big problem that has to be solved. Director Bob. Yeah, I, I don't want to get into the weeds too much, but I, I know we've been looking at this, and, and you just mentioned that MCI is our only viable builder right now. Uh, Proterra is not in the game anymore, and BYD is falling off. But beforehand, my, my question, since we've got a guest in the room from Livermore, is there any potential <laughs> for Gilling to look into electrical buses, or is that not on their radar? So just uh, one clarification, uh, Proterra has given some indication that they're looking at over-the-road coaches. Okay. So. In, and I don't mean to overly focus on MCI because remember we're going to do a competitive process, um, but it could be Proterra, Van Hool, MCI that are all in the game at that time. So we have a nice competition. That would be a beautiful thing. Um, Norm, you can speak for yourself. I know I've talked to Joe about it. I, I thought that over the road coaches weren't on your, your radar screen in the short term. Is that true? That is correct. He's right. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, Gilly has just recently entered into an agreement with uh, Cummins. It's an exclusive three-year deal where they're going to be providing uh, electric drives uh, for auto electric vehicles, but those will be 40, 35, and later on 30-foot vehicles only. A 45-foot over-the-road coach is something that's not on our radar. Um, but yes, we will be building electric buses and Prototypes will be going online later this year. We've already built our first generation of electric buses for CCCTA up in Concord. Uh, but since we signed the agreement with Cummins, we will have to cease and desist making that type of vehicle um, and work with Cummins exclusively. And I think it's going to be a great deal because they will be providing drive motors, uh, energy management systems, and the battery packs themselves. So uh, we will be having those buses going online later this year. And Encourage you, please, if you have a chance to come see us up in Livermore and, and take a look at our electric videos. But 45 foot is not our radar. I, I just want to really give a, a kudos to Gilleg. Um, as we've gone through this regulation, this proposed regulation, uh, and remember how it started out and it's sort of migrating to become a little bit more palatable, Proterra and BYD got out there from day one and even as recently as today. Um, you know, really advocating for the, the regulation and not so much uh, for the changes that as a transit industry we were asking for. They just got out there so let's get this done tomorrow, we can sell lots of electric buses and that's a great thing. Gillick could have done that. Gillick didn't do that. Gillick sat at the table with us at CTA and, and advocated for the things that were important to us. Let's not rush into this, let's be careful, let's be mindful of the fact that the product today even the product that they would build, which uses the same battery technology, can only go about 150 miles. And everybody acknowledges we need buses to go 300 miles end of life after battery degradation 12, 14 years from now. Gillig has been the champion of that, and they've been on our side, and I just want to say thank you. Well, thank you. That's, uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll address that quickly yeah. and just say that uh, Gillig's been in business for 127 years, and, and some of the reasons that we've been so successful for so long is being a little bit conservative is when it comes to jumping into new technologies. And uh, totally agree that uh, battery technology isn't where it really needs to be yet. Um, but as it's being mandated and pushed forward, we have no choice but to go ahead and bring our uh, product to the market. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anybody, you don't want to get Director Rothwell, you're not. I just see the, uh, the red light lighted mic. Oh, oh. Yeah, so, sorry. Okay. Um, so, um, is there something in action? Oh, yes. Please. Please. So I can yes. transmit the letter. Yeah. What a, uh, uh, I motion think the motion uh, to, to recommend an action to, uh, uh, to write the letter and all the other associated pieces. Second. Moved by uh, Leopold, second by Rockin. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excuse me, I, I didn't go to the public, uh, aside from Mr. Gillick. Or, uh, <laughs> representative from this <laughs> Was there any public comment on that? I'm sorry. Uh, okay. It's uh, passed unanimously. Uh, now, number 20, item number 22 approved state right route uh, one bus on shoulders feasibility study. I've heard this presentation a couple times. Very exciting. I think it's a, a tremendous option that might be available to us. Mr. Emerson. Thank you. Board Chair, this item is about the recently completed State Route 1 Bus on Shoulders Feasibility Study. Back in 2016, AMBAG and PANSEAT, the Transportation Agency of Monterey County, 
they awarded to Monterey Salinas Transit and Metro together a grant to study the feasibility of bus and shoulder operations in both counties. I'll speak only to the Santa Cruz County portion today. It's interesting in Monterey County, they not only have the highway with its shoulders, but they also have a rail reserve that's relatively adjacent. So they're having a very interesting conversation down there. This completed study analyzed various approaches to implementing bus on shoulder, and I will say that the full study can be found on the Metro Planning webpage. So if you're interested in the 120 pages, it's there under planning projects. Bus on shoulders is a relatively cost, low cost solution for transit and highway environments when there is not a formal high occupancy vehicle lane or an HOV lane. In many bus on shoulder projects around the country, including the most well known in Minneapolis, bus on, op bus on shoulder operations is on the right shoulder of the highway, and this is an important concept. Very often when you see full HOV lanes or carpool lanes, they're in the center, on the left shoulder. Another example of a, uh, a right-hand shoulder bus on shoulders project is in San Diego Interstate 805 State Route 52, which I was actually involved with for a few years. Initially in Santa Cruz, we were hoping to achieve a left side, inside shoulder operation because it was envisioned the primary use for us was for our services that traveled express from Santa Cruz to Watsonville. We didn't have a great need in our road network to get on and off in the center of the county. Unfortunately, the reality is the engineers looked at it and there were too many structures where we couldn't even move the freeway around and now you're moving into the hundreds of millions of dollars. If you think about taking down interchanges, think about them 50 million a shot. That starts to sneak up on your old 800 million dollar HOV option. But that is all costed in this study as another background fact. Um, using the right shoulder and having buses travel in the auxiliary lanes between the interchanges and having them operate on the shoulders at the interchanges is the proposal on the table at the moment as the, as the preferred one. This particular cost-effective strategy of operating is possible only because of the program of auxiliary lanes that RTC is planning to implement through the county. We all know what auxiliary lanes are. They run from on-ramps to off-ramps, off-ramps. And we have a couple, but we, they're hit and miss. And uh, I'll speak more to that in a second. Rather than operating on the shoulder between interchanges, which would require much further environmental analysis and financial investments, we want to be able to be in the auxiliary lanes, because auxiliary lanes move faster than the adjacent uh, uh, general purpose lanes. And one of the reminders in the bus on shoulders world, we're not going by at 65 miles, 8 inches from parked cars. All the regulations around the country limit you to going up to the most 15 miles an hour faster than the adjacent traffic. But that's really important because it leads to reliability. And if there's anything more important in transit than speed, it's reliability of every trip taking the same amount of time so that people can make transfers and count on the service. So the request today going forward is for <coughs> Metro staff recommends expending up to $50,000 of our current budget in the planning department this year in professional technical fields to have RTC's auxiliary lane design consultant develop an operating concept for Caltrans's review, which would hopefully lead to a subsequent project approval and environmental clearance. Moving through that process, if we get to there, it could be another 250 to 500,000. If we're fortunate enough to get to that point, we'll be back asking some tough choices here, but we gotta get, we gotta get in the queue there. The strategy goal is for the concept to be deemed categorical exempt environmentally and have its design be incorporated into the Oxlane final design project and be constructed as part of the multi-phased auxiliary lane project so we can start using more and more as it comes online. This completes my presentation. However, I'd like to acknowledge that RTC's auxiliary lane project manager, Sarah Christensen, is in attendance and could help address any questions about the bus on shoulders or Oxlane projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any comments from the board? Yes. Uh, comments from the public? Yeah, there, there's a request to uh, approve up to $50,000 for a study on this from the uh, Metro. Yes? Hi, Mr. Director Rockman. I I've had a bunch of questions uh, that I got answered in the RTC about how this would actually work. Uh, you have to say, from my own experience, there's no question that the auxiliary lane that goes from Santa Cruz to SoCal Avenue is faster than the other lanes, and lots of people are sort of in that and waiting to, unfortunately, the very last minute to switch back into the general lane. 
But if pe for people to grasp this, when you get to that bridge where all the traffic goes off to the right, and this is just one example, at SoCal Avenue, the bus would then go under the bridge going straight through, and they probably would have to work out some stuff like signal preemption because there's people coming off of the, that are entering the freeway going south uh, from, the, from SoCal Drop, to, I forget if it's cool. Drive or the Avenue, yeah. whatever it is on that side of the road. SoCal it, Avenue. Avenue where, where they get on the road and so they obviously you don't want to have a conflict and there's a long enough entryway at that intersection so it probably wouldn't be a big conflict but some of the other bridges have a much shorter loading lane so they're going to have to have some way of dealing with that there's a bunch of other issues which I won't go into here again but this is incredibly exciting because it's not that it's going to get to Watsonville twice as fast or something but if people sitting in the traffic on Highway 1 see a bus going by them at even, mm -hmm. you know, saving 20 minutes or 10 minutes for the ride to Watsonville, it, you can't buy advertising that would get people out of their cars the way this would make that happen. I mean, people will just go, why am I sitting in my car when I could be taking the bus and all the other advantages of doing that and actually cheaper in terms of overall cost of car operation. Um, so I'll definitely move this recommendation. It's well worth $50,000 to get further into the study of how this would work. And because this is not taking additional space except under a bridge, and there'll be things there. You're going to have to build a retaining wall. Some of those little sloping things that come down under the bridge probably get in the way of the bus. So you, there might be some cost involved in the actual development of how you get under the bridge with the bus. But what they've studied is that you can do that under every bridge that goes all the way to State, State Park Drive. So, this is really exciting. We would, our buses, it would save us money and time because instead of having every the bus taking, it takes what, four buses or something to get there at a certain time now, we might be able to reduce that to three buses with the same frequency of service. So this is exciting. I move approval of the recommendation. Second. Moved by Rock and second by Rothwell. Uh, Director Boffer, please. I just had one comment. This presentation was made at the RTC, and I thought that the question might be more appropriate here. Kind of a technical question, but. I did get a little confused because it started out, this is called a bus on shoulder program, and what I was envisioning is what I will just simplify as a bus on auxiliary lane program, with the concept being the same is that whether the bus was on the shoulder or the auxiliary lane, it would potentially use the auxiliary lane in some kind of cut through under the bridges to proceed. So my question is what we're perceiving here, because uh, it's going to take more to be able to, to either develop a shoulder or widen the shoulder when, the, when those costs are built into this. And my question is, could this stand alone and just be a bus on auxiliary lane program, which would uh, prevent the bus drivers having to merge from the shoulder to the auxiliary lane? They would just stay on the auxiliary lane the whole time, not using the shoulder. And is that more cost effective, or is that even something we're considering? Right. Sorry to make that question confusing. But. It's on shoulder. Let me, make a, let me make a bus operations clarification, then Sarah can talk about the project. The concept of you're in the auxiliary lane, you're going along, the auxiliary lane gets off at that interchange. The fact that we can then continue under the bridge in what is today shoulder, straight on through, and we rejoin the auxiliary lane 35 yards later. Correct. Was that, was that the question? That's exactly. So we would never really, when I'm talking shoulder, I'm thinking something to the right of the auxiliary lane, and when you're talking shoulder, you're only talking about capturing that space, connecting the two auxiliary lanes. But then we're on the same page. Yes. We are on the same page. So um, just to clarify the option that we're looking at, which is the most cost-effective um, option, and it is the most preferred for um, general freeway operations, I would say, is called the hybrid um, bus on shoulder and the hybrid being uh, the buses travel in the auxiliary lanes and only the only bus on shoulder is at the interchanges between the off-ramp and the on-ramp. So there's some technical challenges with that, obviously. As um, we mentioned, the conflict points with the on-ramp, we can work through that. Um, but mainly the challenge is procedural at this point because we are looking to expedite um, the segment between SoCal and 41st of the bus on shoulder in order to catch up and only go to construction one time for that segment. There's a lot of challenges with that, which we're working through uh, with Caltrans because we are talking about a streamlined project delivery approach with Caltrans. So that in itself is going to be um, a tough sell, but we are working very hard on doing that. And it makes a lot of sense, we think. So we're pushing for that. 
Thanks for the clarification. I appreciate that. Sure. Director Leopold. Uh, the, the, the only other thing I would add from the RTC meeting is that in the cost of something like eight million dollars, there seems to be broad support on the uh, from the RTC to spend the money. They consider that uh, a, a wise investment, actually a low investment, uh, to be able to get this efficiency in the system. So I, 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 that's that's good for Metro. Absolutely. Is anyone else who wants to speak on this? Just a clarification. Yes. Um, so the the expediting of the project is just for that first segment that's going under construction in 2020. Um, the future uh, bus on shoulder facility south of that, we may consider combining it with the auxiliary lane project from the beginning, so we don't have to play catch up. So that's great. Makes yeah, sense. pretty great. Yeah. yeah. Um, any comments from the public? <laughs> Okay, Mr. Clifford. Just one addition, um, just from a, a future marketing perspective, I, I could see us building a whole program around this being our first BRT, mm -hmm. bus rapid transit. Um, you know, potentially having uh, um, nice stops related to this in Santa Cruz and Watsonville, and you know, another attempt to market and gain more ridership. We have I, I would move the recommended actions. Right. By Leopold, second by Bachmore. Sure. Right. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So ordered. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next is item number 23. Uh, approved consideration of authorizing Metro to continue the UCSC articulated bus pilot project for the CEO to execute agreement amendments with the shuttle bus leasing for the buses and with UCSC to fund all related costs of the operations. Mr. Emerson. Still morning, and we're on the last yeah. item. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I told you it was going to be a long right. one. All right, so key point there, three actions. Authorize continuation of the pilot of the articulated buses. Number two, to allow the CEO to execute the agreement with the leasing company and to execute the agreement with UCSC. The key point being UCSC paying all the costs of this project. As they <laughs> yeah. All right. As Metro is not in a position to provide additional trips to and from the campus today with our either vehicle or operator resources, in August last year you approved the pilot project, which ran for two quarters last year, winter and spring quarter. Um, these operated on the five UCSC routes, effectively addressing bus overcrowding and the past five students waiting at stop. That alone made it golden for both the university and Metro. UCSC desires to continue the operations of three buses for the entire three-quarter school year this time. Metro staff recommends continuation through the entirety of the school year to more thoroughly analyze the potential impacts and or benefits over a more substantial amount of time than the five months that we did last year. That completes my presentation, and again, I'd like to acknowledge that Larry Pagler from UCSC is here in attendance and can help with any questions if you desire. Okay. Uh, any questions about this uh, before the board? Yes, Mr. Thomas. Please approve it. Okay. <laughs> 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 I to say. For my first year to my second year, there was like a stark contrast in use of transportation, and articulated buses are just so phenomenal. I, there's not really much to say against it. There hasn't has been any complaints on campus from the student, different student groups. I was really happy. Um, with the outcome of the articulated buses, I'm really happy. They have little slugs on them. Um, so there isn't really any other option go. but yeah. to pass this. Like, right. like Burrell said, we're at UCSC is taking up all the costs anyway, yeah. so you know. So it's just it's, 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 it's been a really helpful program for a lot of students. I've been more inclined to take transportation because I don't have to get passed up, you know. It's either that or, you know, wait 30 minutes for another bus or call an Uber in five minutes. I don't have to do that because these buses are a lot longer to take more students. Right. So it's overall been a really, really um, awesome program on our campus, and I'm glad that it'll continue on for the next three quarters. And I really thank Larry for his awesomeness and helpful in just keeping this program going. Um, so I do I truly do appreciate it. As to the 17,000 students on our campus. Thank you. And let the record reflect the awesomeness of Mr. Payne. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've had breakfast. My adjectives don't come out until after. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any comments from the public? Mr. Montesino. 
part of the monthly we're representing the bus operators and fare transfer folks. Um, you know, we initially had concerns because of, again, the lack of communication uh, and transparency. But I think we've um, uh, gone through a few letters back and forth, and I think we're in a better space now. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? I just want to, again, thank, as it's been done too, thank UCSC. I mean, it's in the conversation a lot with its growth enrollment discussions and et cetera, but it has come to the plate to help uh, Metro time and again, and this is another example of that. And uh, very appreciative of them funding this. It's very much uh, welcomed by Metro. Uh, we have a uh, motion. motion to approve the recommendation. Yeah. Second, by, uh, moved by Rock, and second by Matthews. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay, and we have come to the end. To the end. I think uh, I don't know if there's anything else, but the announcement of the next meeting will be uh, Friday, September 28th at the Santa Cruz City Council Chamber. Uh, this meeting is adjourned.